Here, here. Treasurer Lauterbach. Here. Member Baker. Here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Hatfield. Here. All accounted for. Thank you. All right. Um, we have a very busy night ahead of us. We're going to jump right into our um, official meeting. And so it is now, uh, I've got seven, almost 710. So we're going to call this meeting to order. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, for all of our new guests in the audience, uh, welcome to the Monday, April 19th, 2021, regularly scheduled Board of Agenda meeting. We thank you for joining us tonight. If you guys want to just take a second to come on in. All right, folks, while you're coming in, um, I'm just going to remind everybody, please turn your cell phones off or put them in airplane mode. It, uh, when your phones are on, it will affect the uh, video feed that's being broadcast out to the community. Um, and with that said, Pam, uh, could you please take roll? Sure. President McFarland. Here. Vice President Roche. Here. Secretary Singer. Here. Treasurer Lauterbach. Here. Member Baker. Here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Hatfield. Here. All accounted for. Okay, thank you, Pam. Uh, first up, we have item two. This is our consent agenda. This is item 2.1, is the approval of the minutes from March 15, 2021, regularly uh, scheduled meeting. Uh, adding to that is item 2.2, the minutes from the March 15, 2021, closed session. Item 2.3 is a list of uh, people recommended for employment. 2.4 is a list of staff members that, that announced their resignation on the effective dates listed. 2.5 is a food service renewal. Administration recommends a renewal of a food service contract with Chartwells for the 21-22 school year. This is the second renewal of a five-year contract. 2.6 is the approval of payment, school, payment of the school system's bills for the month of February 2021 as listed in the check registers prepared by Ms. Holderby in the amount of $6,388,099 is recommended. The distribution of obligations by fund is included in the documentation. Supporting documents have been included. 2.7 is approval is requested to authorize legal payments to Truon Law Firm for $19,358.50. I move to approve consent agenda item 2.1 through 2.6. Support. Seven. Seven. 2.7 7 actually. Support. Support by John Hatfield. Any discussion regarding items in the consent agenda? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Next up, presentations to the board. Item 3.1, this is a COVID-19 update from Midland County Health Director, Fred Yanoski. frame, but I'm happy to answer any questions that I don't get to throughout the evening. So again, thanks for the opportunity. I want to just touch uh, quickly statistically where we're at in the county right now. I'm um, provide a quick little up update on vaccinations and also address uh, the school experience that we've had so far during COVID and uh, what you can do moving forward. So statistically, I passed on a piece of uh, uh, literature with some statistics I pulled uh, fresh today. Now they are not real time, they're running a couple days behind. But these are Michigan Department of Health and Human Services statistics. So I want to at least briefly address where we're at community-wise and where we've been. So the graph I'm going to address first, there are two metrics that we use uniformly in public health to gauge where a community is at with COVID-19. And one of them is positivity percentage, and the second is cases per million. So currently, we are not, as a community, in a very good spot. We are, uh, today's positivity rate was 16.7%. And the graph below kind of dictates where we've been since the uh, onset of COVID early in 2020. And you can see positivity percentage, we are as high as the community as we have been. 
Now, there are some different factors that impact that. Um, one, uh, the most uh, predominant one would be testing. So if you look at our graph as we move through, probably our worst peak uh, that you would remember would be right around the 1st of November. Our positivity percentage was just a little bit lower than it is now. However, our cases per million, which is the following graph, were a little bit higher. So essentially, we're having some less testing. Uh, folks taking advantage of uh, testing more in November than they were now, and that doesn't have an impact on our positivity percentage. But raw cases, for the most part, are still high. We, uh, one day last week, set our our COVID high with 100 cases in a 24-hour period. So certainly that is uh, not a positive for our community. Um, we are seeing some signs of it trending a little more positive, but in a community of 83,000 people, statistically, our numbers are rather fragile. So a, a couple bad days with, when our numbers get multiplied by a multiplier to meet that cases per million, um, it can be a little bit fragile and they can be greatly affected in a small period of time. Unfortunately, we were less than a percent positivity rate as, as most recent as uh, February. So certainly we have had a, uh, a, a large spike in the last uh, several weeks and uh, we investigate every case from the county health perspective. So every positive case we contact to do what's called a case investigation on and I can generalize by saying at this point in time, the vast majority of our cases are coming from gatherings, whether they are um, religious in nature, social in nature, um, or other gatherings where largely public health measures such as distancing and masks are not utilized. The second uh, primary area of spread is families. So we have a lot of, uh, you know, what we've learned from the, from the onset of COVID is it is highly transmissible in close personal settings. So we have a lot of families, unfortunately, that if someone in the household would get COVID and they were unable to isolate, we have a lot of infection within families. So between gatherings and families, that's where the vast majority of our cases are coming from. It's kind of interesting in the cases per million part that uh, certainly that's a way that we can look at Midland County and compare it to Genesee County or Wayne County or different size communities by having that multiplier and placing it in cases per million. If you look at the key at the bottom, uh, the lowest level which we want to be in is less than seven cases per million. So even in February when we were down to um, under 1% positivity, to achieve in a community the size of Midland to achieve less than 1%, um, or I'm sorry, less than seven cases per million, we have to have about a case every two and a half days. So it's a very, very small number for, get to, for us to get to that. Um, moving forward, the second page or the back of the sheet that I gave you is um, tried to get some school district specific data for you. So this is data we pulled from uh, zip codes 48640 and 48642. Now that gives you a little bit more than just uh, the normal Midland area, but um, you can look at the first graph I provided you was cases of uh, referral date, cases by referral date. That's gonna look real similar to that cases per million. So those are just our raw case counts. And you can see the large spike around the 1st of November, and you can see where we're at now. Um, it doesn't look exactly like your positivity percentage because the positivity percentage is greatly impacted by how many tests are taken advantage of in the community. So, um, but this will look very similar to your cases um, per million. Now, the, the bottom chart is a breakdown of school age cases that we've had in those two zip codes. So you can see that a total in the pandemic of 633 cases are school age folks of 18 or under. Now, again, this isn't perfect. There's some estimations as far as what grade level folks are in, so it's, it's not exact data but the age limits of 18 and under, there's 633 cases. About 200 of those we've seen since the first of the year. So certainly, you know, uh, it's been an ongoing issue with a large spike in the fall, and then we saw another spike in, in March and April. So 200 of those in, uh, uh, in this particular calendar year. Now, I think moving forward, of course, we've had no vaccine available largely for this group. So what we've seen is a shift with disease moving from an older population to, to a younger population. So 39, you know, uh, 15 to 39 is our hottest group right now where we're seeing a lot of infections. Um, and again, tracing that back to activities and behaviors, you're looking at gatherings, you're looking at uh, groups together, and no social distancing or mask wearing is what we've determined in our investigations. So um, that kind of gives you an idea of what's happening locally. Again, we are fragile as a community. We've seen peaks and valleys, but most of our numbers mirror what's happening to some extent within the region and the state. Um, I know we have seen some positives uh, in the last week where we see statewide 
and locally, some of our numbers plateauing and even trending downward a little bit. So we would hope that uh, um, with the um, vaccine coming quicker and getting some of these younger folks and maybe the epi curve kind of trending downward, we're hoping for some positive movement. I think eight days in a row we've seen some positive trends downward in cases per million in Midland County. So certainly we hope that uh, trend continues in that direction. Any questions on statistically where we're at? Just to recap, we are not in a great spot locally. And I will say as we merge into vaccinations, uh, your school environment, which you're particularly having an interest in, um, is often how well your community does dictates how well your school does. And I'll uh, kind of address a little bit later uh, in more detail, our schools have done better than our community is doing statistically. And I'll get to that in a moment. So um, vaccination wise, we as the health department have done over 16,000 vaccinations. Um, again, we've got three vaccines available. Only one of them, Pfizer, is, um, is eligible for 16 and up. Everything else is, the other two are 18 and up. So we are certainly hoping, we have some plans in place with all of our districts in the county to provide some vaccinations to those interested school age folks 16 or up later on this month. So hopefully that will uh, increase this population. It has vaccination made a tremendous effect on morbidity and mortality in our older population. I know that we estimate that about 80% of our Midland County seniors 65 and older have been fully vaccinated and that has uh, made a tremendous impact on the incidence of disease that we're seeing in that age group and certainly in mortality. So as we offer, as, as vaccine becomes more available and it is not uh, widespread available at this point, we're still getting limited amounts. For instance, the County of Midland, our health department gets between 700 and 1,000 doses per week. So it's not a tremendous amount. Uh, we certainly give it out as soon as we get it and we give it to eligible groups based on the state guidelines. So early in the vaccination program, it was uh, seniors and we kind of went by priority in the risk groups, but now it's available for anyone 16 and older. So we're gonna make arrangements to get that out to our school age population. Um, again, we think um, estimate that about 50% of Midland County, which is a little bit higher than the state average, have had at least one vaccine. You do get a significant amount of protection from that first dose, and then you're fully protected 14 days after the second dose. So about 50% of our population has had at least one dose, and about a quarter of our population is fully vaccinated. So those are certainly positives that we want to keep building on. Um, I think our staff vaccinations for your school-related staff in the county um, that we did back in February were very successful. I think we had between 70 and 80% of all of our staff that chose to be vaccinated from most of our school districts. And certainly I think that a positive impact on um, teachers being quarantined and be able to have to be uh, removed from work and whatnot. So I'm um, very positive in our school as far as the vaccination strategy. And again, the advisement from public health is we currently have Johnson & Johnson on pause uh, for a closer look, but we would certainly suggest that anyone who is willing don't, uh, don't hesitate, get whatever vaccine is available to you as soon as you can, and that's the best thing you can do at this point. Now the school experience, I will say, is we have learned um, in Midland, we've learned statewide, um, and it is my strong opinion that kids do better in school and are safer in school than the majority of the activities that they engage in outside of school. I think our schools have done a tremendous job of mitigating disease by actively isolating and quarantining. And we know isolated is when an individual who is ill is, is isolated and quarantine is those who are potentially exposed. Well, those are very powerful tools for public health in a respiratory borne infectious disease. And I can tell you that as the event has progressed, that ability to isolate and quarantine in the community has got weaker. You know, people aren't complying, people aren't complying with their quarantines, people want to move around, and uh, it's been more difficult for us to get compliance from our community. However, in the school community, um, by excluding those students from school, um, it is a tremendous tool for us to mitigate spread within the schools. So we might, we've historically seen um, in Midland County, you know, at, at times hundreds of kids or staff quarantined. The resulting cases we get from those quarantined individuals is really quite low. So in other words, that's a public health tool that really works in the school population to mitigate disease. And we have not seen in any of our school districts a, uh, a tremendous amount of in-school spread. That's in sports spread, in class spread, and it's, uh, I think, 100% uh, due to the tremendous um, safe practices and distancing and cohorting and all the other tools the schools use to mitigate disease, and that has been a very effective tool for us. So. You know, moving forward with that school experience, 
you know, we are here to advise and support. We often um, consult with all of our school districts and all of our schools. Um, we look at statistics. We talk about new um, reg um, requirements or recommendations coming down from the state and address what that means to your school district. But certainly we're here to advise, support, and I can say that our schools have done a tremendous job in mitigating disease in order to stay open for the children. So um, again, our ultimate goal is to mitigate disease. So isolation and quarantine, vaccine, and public health measures are our strongest tools that we have, and we've proved that they work. Um, again, with vaccine coming to those 16 and older, um, we hope that that probably closer to the end of May or June would have a tremendous amount on us moving forward into the future. There are other things disease transmission wise, when you have a contagious respiratory disease, of course, seasonality is often your friend. So moving outdoors, more things open, that should be another positive with, uh, with less internal transmission in a closed environment. And again, the one takeaway that I will give you for March 2020 compared to April 2021, we have a highly transmissible respiratory disease that no one has any natural immunity to and it is very contagious. I know we have the presence of variants in our community and in every community in Michigan and the variant is now one of our variants B117 is now the predominant strain in, strain in Michigan. So variants are thought to be a little more contagious and a little more transmissible. So certainly that probably also has a role in the spread and recent increase in disease in our community as well. So. Um, again, moving forward, I think we have uh, some real positives. Statewide, our, our rates are plateauing and trending downward. We also have a program that uh, um, we work with Saginaw Valley State University to monitor some wastewater for virus. And so we've been able to use that as, a, as another tool in our toolbox to predict virus. And I know when our, our numbers went up, there was a, um, viruses shed in waste early in disease. So prior to our big spike in March, we saw a pretty profound uh, increase in those uh, uh, virus particles in our wastewater. And we mm. recently see the trend downward in those as well. So mm. there's plenty of indicators around to think we're making a positive uh, impact and that we're gonna start trending downward. But again, it's, it's fragile and uh, we all have to participate to make that a reality with our public health measures and uh, seeking vaccination. So again, I just wanna close by really applauding all of our schools, Midland Public Schools and all of our schools for doing a tremendous job and uh, again, this is a, a task that we have to be humble about. And there was things that we know now that we didn't know in uh, March of 2020, and we're learning. And I think we need to, in schools and in the community, learn how we're gonna live through this and mitigate disease by doing the best we can and, and uh, um, um, instituting safe practices. And I think that some of the things we learned in schools and other places will certainly move forward and being part of our daily activity with with safe practices and uh, COVID measures that have really made an impact on uh, how healthy our workplaces can be. So with that, um, I'm certainly, I tried to be brief. I apologize if I went too fast. I'm happy to entertain any questions on where we're at or, or where we've been. Fred, is there any statistical data that uh, ties our trends and what's going on with your tracing and spring break? Um, we have usually, you can look out from an event um, about three weeks, whether it was the inauguration in the fall or when uh, President Trump's vision uh, visited the airport in the fall or Christmas holidays or spring break. And you can look out three weeks to see if that event really made an impact. Quite frankly, we have seen cases associated with spring break, but it was a little bit skewed for us because our numbers were quite high when people left. So um, we have seen a small impact. We have been able to link some of those cases, but certainly the vast majority of our cases we're local in transmission. Okay. So if that answers your question. Yes, and, and quite frankly, it's, uh, uh, I'll uh, characterize it as it's not necessarily where you go, it's what you do. And uh, in some of the inhibitions that uh, some folks would experience on spring break would put them at just a high of risk locally when there's a lot of prevalence of disease in the community. But it's been, we have seen cases, but most have been local. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Pam, John, anybody else? Any questions? Okay. We really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you okay. so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Next up, we are at item 3.2. This is instructional technology. Mr. Toners, your presenters, Mr. McFarland. While Melissa's coming to the podium, I'll tell you during COVID from 
March until now, she has been a key member of recruiting how we deliver instruction. <laughs> We'll let the boring tech guy go first, so we'll get the, get the techno babble out of the way and then we'll let Melissa talk. So, um, Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for letting us talk tonight about technology and, and uh, where we're at. Um, when we were going through and packing up and purging a lot of documents for, for the move, getting rid of all the old stuff that we've had around forever, I found lots of documents from the late 80s and early 90s. Went through and found, I, I, it was an interesting walk down uh, technology memory lane. Um, just thinking about some of the things that we had to pay in the past, like buying computers for $2,500 in $1995, which is $4,300 in current money. No one would pay $4,300 for a small desktop now, I and mean, our phones can do even more. So it was really interesting going through there. Um, that purging helped me go through and kind of revisit where we've been and how far we've come uh, in the last 20 years. We've come a long way. And tonight, I'd like to focus for you a little bit just on the last few years what we've actually implemented and what we've done with technology in the district and what we've what we've added to the district um, there's been a lot of uh, focus especially in this last year on client devices remote learning and probably the number one thing that we did as a district um, that helped us um, in advance besides the fun having a solid fund balance was purchasing one-to-one -one devices we already had one-to-one -one devices for all of our students which was huge because we, you, you can't get devices in a timely manner anymore. Um, the stuff that we ordered in February that you approved uh, is still not slated to be here until August. So that was a huge, huge blessing. Um, we've added, we have added 180 hotspots for students, for all the students that do not have um, technology or uh, internet connection at home, we've added all of that. We extended the help desk support, so now we offer help desk support for not just staff uh, and faculty. We also offer support for parents and students, and we've extended those hours from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. so that we're making sure that we're covering the virtual class hours and a little bit after in case somebody needs to come down and have something dealt with. We've added digital temperature scanning devices. Um, we've added, uh, this year we added a couple swivel robots that we're trying that help with hybrid learning and also help teachers record help dynamic teachers record uh, lessons for students to go back and watch. Uh, they're a robot with a uh, tablet on them that allows the teacher to not just be the talking head teacher, it allows them to get around the room and it follows them and records what they do or streams what they do for their hybrid, for the virtual kids that are attending their class remotely. Um, we've added voice enhancement systems and we've updated the projection systems in the classroom to modern uh, ones that use LEDs, LED lamps. They're much lower energy use. They um, also much less expensive to replace the bulbs. Um, we've modernized the media centers. All of our media centers now have breakout spaces for the kids to meet in small collaborative groups. On the server side, we've gone through and added building automation systems. So. I think by the end of this year, we'll be all of our buildings will be automated, which is fantastic. Um, if you've ever seen some of the old stuff that we had in the buildings to regulate our systems, it was a wide variety of things, and there was a lot of things we couldn't do remotely. It was all manual, so that's fantastic. That helps us stay energy efficient and and be able to react more quickly to issues. Um, Transportation Department has added uh, new bus routing software um, and bus management software, fleet management software, and radio server. So that we're able to use radios both for the buses and for building administrative staff, and um, actually my staff use them as well. It's fantastic because there are some places cell phones just aren't reaching. So um, we've added access control systems to all of our building and security, con security camera systems with 300 cameras. Um, We've added Raptor Visitor and Raptor Alert, which helps protect our, our buildings and helps protect our staff and students. We've replaced the network top to bottom in the last year uh, with a high speed, higher speed, uh, wired and wireless network with far more coverage than we've ever had before. Um, and we've done some innovative things as far as leveraging a technology called CWDM, which lets you use just specific uh, light waves to be able to use existing fiber from MCONET to bring uh, the post-secondary program onto our network. So no longer are they 
off on the community centers network. They're actually on our network now and they can use our phone systems, they can use our printers, they can use all of our systems the way they're meant to be used without having to make funny workarounds to make things work. Uh, we have had digital signage both internally and externally at all of our buildings. We have uh, also gone through and added a virtual phone server for the move here to the auditorium, which is a really interesting uh, it's been an interesting experience because we don't have to have a phone set at our desk right now. We are using our cell phones and using our uh, desktops as our phone. We have also uh, been live streaming board meetings now for about the past year, not just through the TV station, but we are live streaming on YouTube. And now we are able to live stream on both Apple TV and Roku. And in the next, hopefully a few weeks, we'll be live streaming on um, Android TV and iOS, thanks to MCTV's efforts with their over-the-top application. Um, Google Meet and Zoom. Uh, we, this year would have not been possible in some ways without that technology, and everybody dove in and adopted it very well. Um, we've added classroom management software. Actually, Melissa sent out information on that last week, two weeks ago, and teachers have been able to use that to make sure kids are staying more on task even remotely, which has been fantastic. It, it tells the teacher what the kids are doing. If they're off on a different off task, they can help bring people back on task and, and keep learning. Um, and that's just a small sample. Those are the big items. There's a lot of little things. Um, just some stats about what we've done in the last few years uh, data-wise. Uh, in the last well, since we started with Google, we are now using 46 terabytes of storage at Google. To put that in comparison, on site, we have two and a half terabytes of storage that we're using for local file storage. Um, 46 terabytes is also about the size of what we have for our whole server farm that the virtual servers run. We have 90 virtual servers that take up about that space as well. So that's a massive amount of space that we are blessed to be able to use. Um, our... Uh, Every week we have about 6,000 active users in Gmail, and those users, since October, since that's the, as far back as the data in Google goes, they, uh, our users have um, received 10 and a quarter million emails and sent one and a quarter million emails just since the beginning of October. Um, we catch 2,500 spam messages per day when that happens too. And then we average 7,000 users a week in Google Drive, which is almost everyone. And since October, we have created one and a quarter million files. So that's it for the technology side of it. I'm going to turn it over to Melissa now, who's far more interesting than I am. So. <laughs> hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. Yes, sir. What, what other, uh, we're getting some technology updates right now. With, with you doing all that purging and moving out of the administration center, are we getting additional technology gains when we remodel at the administration center? Uh, I'm not aware of anything off the top of my head right now, but okay. we, we, we still have uh, the staff laptops to bring to you at some point. That's scheduled to be done this year, but that's an across the district thing. Um, we've already done digital signage in there. What I think he's referring to is a relocation of your server room, Dave, in the back oh. of the generator. Yeah. Yeah, we are doing that. I apologize. I forgot about that. I shouldn't. It's been a long time on the backup generator. Um, so yes, we are doing that this year. Um, the server room relocation, last I heard, the door's in, uh, new door's cut in, and they're able to access that space, and they're getting it prepped, so. Great. Okay. And there'll be other bond work down the road. Um, series 3, Brad, when we sell that for technology. That's mostly refreshes. Correct. Yep. So, Thanks, we'll Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Okay. <laughs> all right, good evening. Um, so, I mean, without the IT team and all of that, support with all of the other equipment these instructional tools wouldn't work as well as they do so um, i wanted to share with you a little bit about the instructional technology tools that teachers and students are using in the classroom and then I'll, I'll just give an overview because we have a lot of apps and extensions and all kinds of software that we have access to and we're very fortunate to do that but i also have a video that was created by um, our three of our students uh, Julia and Nora and Emily Locker, where they are going to share in their video how they use uh, Chromebooks and instructional technology in the classroom. So they're going to share their, some of their experiences. And then um, Diane White, who is a teacher at Dow High, and one of her students, Sienna Matichek, is going to come and share some of the work that they're doing with instructional technology as far as Project Lead the Way, 
and some of the um, really interesting things that they are learning and producing, student produced. So I guess first of all, I'll just give an overview of some of the interactive tools that we are using that um, students and staff use, uh, teachers, everyone basically in the districts using Google tools. And um, through the Google uh, workspace, we have docs and we have Google Slides, Sheets, Forms, um, and there's also Google, there's Jamboard, which is a whiteboard that's interactive that our teachers are using not only in our virtual Google Meets, but also in the classroom to engage students. And so with these tools, it allows for individual work, but it also allows for collaborative work. And so quite often you'll see in the classroom, students that are working on research projects, they're creating documents together, presentations together. It also integrates really well with our Canvas learning management system. So uh, the Google tools can be directly input, embedded into the system so that students have access to, they can access links, they can access complete documents that a teacher's posted, they can submit assignments. And so these tools work really well, um, back and forth between Canvas talking to Google and Google talking to Canvas. Um, also with Canvas, it, since it's our learning management system that we've adopted for the district, uh, we are using it to, um, to, for content delivery, for synchronous and asynchronous delivery. And so even in our face-to-face -face classrooms, it's not just for virtual use, teachers are using it so that, that students have access to the content. And it works really well, um, like I mentioned, with the Google tools. But we also have some additional tools that are, um, they're, con they're called external tools and LTIs. LTIs are really apps. Uh, that integrate with Canvas. So um, teachers are able to use some of these apps just to embed activities that engage students. Um, students can create things, for example. We have um, Kami, which is a PDF an annotation type of tool. And so teachers can use that and share those, I guess, those documents with students. Students can share with students as well. But they can annotate, highlight, comment. They can do voice uh, recordings within the documents and share. And, and create um, to demonstrate their, their learning outcomes. We also have, um, we've added some LTIs such as ChemType and MathType, which allow teachers and students to have an equation um, editor so that they can um, use that embedded in the activities in Canvas. We also have um, links to um, originality reports, which really works with Google as well. Um, originality reports is something fairly new that we just shared out maybe a couple of weeks ago. But um, teachers and students can use it to scan uh, documents that students have created. So it's a learn it can be used as a learning tool for students to check their citations and, and learn how to properly cite papers and uh, research documents. And then teachers can also use it to scan documents um, using it as a feedback tool to work with students. And that's also integrated with Canvas. Uh, we also have discussion boards in Canvas, so um, even though we may not be in a remote situation, teachers are still using those discussion boards to get student interaction. So we have a lot of our apps and these LTIs integrate with Canvas, but yet we can use them in a variety of ways. Um, and it, it uh, allows for um, students to, um, to be able to share with their peers and to be able to communicate and collaborate. Um, with Cami, just David mentioned some statistics that uh, he had gathered, and just for an so you have an idea, um, with the Cami application, we had over 200,000 annotations created in January, and that wasn't really our peak. In November, when we were working remotely, we had um, we had over 300, almost 350 annotations. So really, what that's doing is tracking how much students and teachers are interacting with each other in, with these tools. We also have, um, we purchased Pear Deck, which is another interactive tool that can be used even in remote learning. It has an LTI to Canvas, and it can also be used in the face-to-face -face classroom. I've seen it used really um, amazingly in uh, classrooms that I have visited. Um, one teacher used Pear Deck. It, it works with Canvas, or I'm sorry, with, um, it works with Google Slides and Canvas, but in Google Slides, they're able to have an interactive presentation where students can respond to the teacher. The teacher can respond whole class or individually. They can also uh, embed little quizzes for checks for understanding. But um, one of the ways that I saw this used in a face-to-face -face classroom is the teacher just wanted to get a feel for how the students were 
were feeling that day. Um, he had a sense that maybe some of them weren't quite ready to learn. And so he said, how do you feel today? Draw an emoji um, uh, of what your feelings are like. And he used this tool just to get a feel for where the kids were that day. And um, once they started drawing, the, you could tell the mood just picked up right away in the classroom. And, and they, they shared how they were feeling. And the teacher could respond individually so no one else could see the response. If there's a student that maybe was, had some concerns about, then he, he caught up with that student a little bit later. So um, Pear Deck is really amazing. We had, um, they count their, their activity by moments of engagement. And so there were over 116,000, almost 117,000 moments of engagement um, in September, from September to January. So what that means is just, it's when the students are interacting with the, with the teacher. And we had um, over 1,200 presentations created, but that doesn't mean it was only used 1,200 times. It's that they could set up that particular presentation, but embed a variety of activities and use it in a variety of ways in face-to-face -face or in virtual learning. We have um, about a little over 200 um, approved Android apps that are used with our Chromebooks. Primarily right now, they're used with the elementary Chromebooks. Um, because our, I think when we get our new models, I think Dave, for secondary, they'll be able to um, be compatible with Android apps. But we have over 200 apps that can be used for um, various things. Some of them, it's, a, it's gamifying learning. Some things our students are creating with Adobe apps. Uh, some of them are tied to our, are connected with our Project Lead the Way launch uh, modules. And so um, one example would be Scratch Junior, where the elementary students are starting to learn how to code. So it's really exciting to see them use those apps. We also have around 90 um, Chrome extensions that are available to, to students and staff, and we continue to add those um, as we vet them to make sure they're in alignment with our content and what we, what we want to see as learning outcomes. But um, Chrome extensions are basically apps that I would say it's kind of a shortcut to get to a website. And so our students have access to a variety of those. Some of our favorite, I would say, the favorite when you look at the stats is Screencastify. Screencastify allows for students to create, and teachers, to create videos and they can edit them, share them, and it, it connects with um, Canvas and with Google tools. So let's see, I'm throwing out a lot of things in a hurry, so <laughs> I'll just kind of sum it up here. Um, one thing that we're really excited about is with our media centers. Uh, Dave mentioned some of the technology, but we also have a fairly new uh, database for our collections. It's File at Destiny. And um, with that system, we've been able to use mark rec change our mark records so that they're in alignment with uh, some of our DEI, SEL, and Project Lead the Way, and IB. Uh, interactions and curriculum so that we can code books to for a quick search so for instance if I'm looking for a quick search for something that's related to um, I'm trying to think project lead the way um, maybe it's coding um, the students or teachers can quickly go into the file system and put in a topic um, it can be even project lead the way or it can be DEI and a variety of books will come up and you can narrow your searches down and so we didn't really have that in the past um, we also have interlibrary loans, which is exciting as well because um, teachers and students can also put books on hold or request books from building to building as long as they're appropriate for the age, their age. And we've added around 400 ebooks since March to that collection, and they're multi user. So um, we're, we're hoping to expand that as well. But we really need to get out there and advertise that we have them. We're not getting uh, quite the usage that we were hoping for, but part of that's because we haven't had the chance to really show how these, how these books can be used. And so we're, we're working on that. Laura Peel and I are, we have plans. <laughs> so that will be fun. Um, we also um, utilize Canvas for DEI and we have some professional learning. Teachers are using it. Buildings, I know Midland High is using an all-staff Canvas site, so just so you know, we're using it for more than just in the classroom. And we have Illuminate DNA that we're also, um, it's a data warehouse where um, teachers can also create assessments in Illuminate, but we also are using it for DEI. We have our active ally reporting and some SEL reports in there as well. So 
with that, there are so many things I could talk about, but I think probably the most exciting thing for you tonight would be able to see what the students have to say, rather than me going through another whole list of things. And, and then for Diane and her student to come in, they're gonna share a little bit in the demonstration. So right now we have a video of our three students, um, Julia, Nora, and Emily. Hi, I'm Julia, and I'm a fifth grader at Seaburn Elementary School. One way we can use Chromebooks at school is that there's websites like Google Classroom and Google Canvas. On those websites, we can have assignments and links to other websites for our learning. A way that we can use our Chromebooks at home is that there are websites that allow adaptive and interactive learning. This means that when you're going through the website, it'll give you easier or harder problems depending on how good you were doing. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Nora and I'm a seventh grader at Jefferson Middle School. Online, we're still able to connect with our classes because we can use technology such as Google Meet and Canvas. In person, because of COVID, we're not able to do as many labs, so we're able to use online lab resources so we get still get the same experience. Thank you. Hi, I'm Emily and I'm a 10th grader at Dow High School. One way that we can use our computers at home is if we have to stay homesick for any reason, we won't get behind in our schoolwork and we can still work on what the class is working on. One way you, we use our computers in school is by all being able to work on the same document with our classmates and work collaboratively. Hmm. Would you like to come up? And they're going to share a little bit about what they are doing in their Project Lead the Way course. Sorry, thank you for giving us just a minute here. Um, good evening, my name is Diane White and I'm a math and computer science teacher at Dow High School. Uh, when Melissa asked me to share some of the ways we're using technology in my classes, I immediately thought about sharing some of the things we're doing in our new project, Lead the Way Computer Science course. The Computer Science Essentials class is filling a void that we had in our math and computer science department. It offers a beginning computer science course that's really for all students. Any student can have a broad introduction to computer science and learn some of the valuable skills um, that prepare them for college and careers after high school. Um, this class focuses on nationally defined computer science practices that go well beyond just simply writing code that you think about with computer science. We foster inclusive computer culture. We build um, collaboration skills and communication skills with our students. We, of course, are working on problem solving skills both independently in pairs and in small groups as, as we've been able to for this year. Um, then, of course, from those problem-solving skills, we actually start to code problems to solve those problems, and, and that's where we move into our code and creating programs and under various environments and creating various uh, computational artifacts. Um, I do want to share with you that I feel like this year that having the smaller class sizes, I know that that's not always easy and it is expensive, but it's made a big difference for us more than just the, the social distance and the safety protocols to be implemented. Particularly this year, my smaller class size has allowed me to have resources available to all of the students to take home when we've gone into remote learning that otherwise might not have been the case. 
And my colleague at Midland High, Kendall Root, and myself, we have worked together to ensure that both of us were sharing resources, we're sharing hardware as needed to make sure that all of our MPS students have had what they've needed, at least for our computer science essential classes, so that we can keep going with our regular Project Lead the Way curriculum. And I wasn't sure that was going to be possible when we went to remote, but due to the sizing and, and us working together, we've really been able to continue with our full regular curriculum, which, is, which has been nice. Um, also, I want to uh, thank Technology Services. They've been great to work with. They've helped us get things out in a timely fashion, make sure that all our devices are SIPA compliant, and those pieces that are very important. Um, in addition to their help with distributing some of these technology devices for my Computer Science Essentials class, they also helped me with my other Computer Science 1 and 2 class by providing some software called Citrix. Um, Citrix has allowed the students who don't have access to a Windows computer at home computer at home, which the software we use in these other courses really need a Windows-based computer to operate. And it has allowed their Chromebook then to act as a portal and actual um, kind of virtually log in to those lab computers in our computer lab and work from that same software just like they were in the classroom. So that's been really nice as we've gone into remote learning as well that they've been able to help us and provide, provide that for us. Um, so I want to thank both all the administrative instructional team and the technical team and, and our campus administrators for really all the support we've had this year as we've gone into remote learning where I feel like we've been able to do really what's best for kids during this difficult year. And on that night, I'd like to turn things over to Sienna, and she is a sophomore in my computer science essential class, and she's going to share with you just some of the things um, we've been doing this year. So I don't know if those printouts here and stuff if you're interested in what you want to use. But. All right. Uh, my name is Sienna Madachek. I'm a sophomore at Dow High and I am a part of Mrs. White's Computer Science Essentials class. So during the first sem semester we started with more block-based programming and we started to learn the basics of what code really is. So for example we learned things like while loops, nested loops, um, if-then statements and we then used what we learned and then went into prod using projects from Project Lead the Way. Um, and then I have an example of one of my projects. I don't know if you can hear me, I'm sorry. <laughs> so one of the projects we were assigned One of the projects we were assigned during the first semester was to make our own app based off of the knowledge that we have. So this was the project that I made. Oh, it's upside down, one second, I'm sorry. So I created a drawing app for my project. So basically I uploaded photos of certain animals. And so basically the point of the app is you pick a um, picture of an animal that you would want to draw and then you would start the timer and you would draw the animal. Sorry, my drawing is not that good. It's not gonna be fantastic. <laughs> so let's add some wings. And when we press stop time, if we finish the time uh, before the timer runs out, you would win a point and you would say you win. And so if you wanted to play again, everything would reset. And yeah, that's basically my app. I wasn't that good during my first semester. <laughs> And then during the second semester, we started to go into text-based coding and we started to use self-driving cars. And so with the self-driving cars, we were able to apply knowledge that we learned during the first semester. And we worked with partners to, uh, through, we were assigned certain shapes to make our cars move through or to certain spots from one spot to another on our mats through Project Lead the Way. And we mostly worked on our own. We would get some help from Mrs. White if we needed to. But really, a good part of this project was we were able to work on communication with your partners when we were having trouble. And it's really just, a, it was a really good project just to put our minds to. And we were able, able to think uh, by ourselves without that much help from our teachers. And so, uh, <laughs> show it. Or two of the 
doesn't really matter. So this is just make sure it's really yeah. All right. yes. <laughs> so this is one of the projects that we learned. We were assigned to have the um, part move to make a spiral in, on the map. And uh, before quarantine, we were also working on having the um, car move from one spot to another. But then also we added cones for obstacles, and we were working on we were working on having the car be able to sense the obstacles and move around it. But because of quarantine, we weren't able to finish it. But <laughs> <laughs> keep going for a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, nice Thank job. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sienna. I know one of the things we had to learn about was the precision and how every little detail matters, the, the change on the texture of the floor underneath. And really working with these self-driving vehicles as part of our Project Lead the Way. I mean, it's such a relatable experience for our students today that the, uh, driving and being part of autonomous vehicles will be part of the, in their lifetime, right? So we were able to think through um, all kinds of ethical issues that go on with that and and talk through all the various considerations and inputs that have to be considered um, so thank you Santa and I want to close with letting you know that there are many exciting technology integrations happening all over Dow High and in both of our high schools all the departments between utilizing their Chromebooks extensively during the remote learning and also when they're you know in class face to face you'll find teachers implementing all kinds of interactive websites and their electronic textbook resources the many features within canvas many that Melissa shared with you they're just being used daily um, this is just to name a few of the exciting things going on with technology in uh, both of our high schools so I just want to thank you all for your support oh, that's great I wanted to make a comment so Any it's questions? it's um it's the whole process here what you what you laid out for us is pretty neat how Dave started this and and told us how you know the infrastructure that we've created is creating opportunities not only for our schools to run but down to the student and educator level to really uh, create opportunities for our students and nobody knew that this last year we were going to be forced into using technology even beyond our wildest dreams. And to have this opportunity where you can, in your own home, program and create, you know, move a robot and create an app where you can create a fun game for someone to draw wild animals or birds. It, to me, um, what you're learning in not only programming, but collaboration, and then the background of what it takes to run all of this, and what Santa's doing would not be possible without all three of you behind her and, and the group behind you guys to make that happen. And I, I guess I have a lot of gratitude for our community as well because without the bond, we wouldn't have these opportunities. So, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. It's definitely all the pieces coming together. Yes, thank you. Anything else? Any other questions, comments? I just have a question. I don't know if it's for Dave or, or Melissa, but this has been a very helpful discussion about technology. I'm curious, when, when we go back to in-person learning, we have a student who's in quarantine, how does that student interact with the classroom? That's more of a you question. Okay. That's more of a you question. Well, um, we have the cam Canvas as our learning management system. So teachers are still using that and face-to-face -face or remote. And so content will be available there. We also still have access to Google Meet. And we also have swivel uh, robots where um, some of our teachers have used those most recently when they do have a group of students that are quarantined and a group of students that are face-to-face. -face, they're able to live stream 
uh, their lessons and even some teachers are makeshifting using their Chromebook and their laptop to live stream and um, meet face to face with their students with the Chromebook. So we're hoping, hoping that we will have a few more swivels to loan out, but um, that was really my that question. That would be wonderful. <laughs> How many swivels do we have? Uh, right, right now, two. How many do we need? Uh, well, <laughs> we've talked, uh, we've John, talked, you know, yes. four or five a building. Is that the right answer? But they are not available. So we were, we were lucky to get these two. We were one of the first groups in. We saw them. Actually, I think I may have mentioned the day if he chased, he got a couple and then the market went dry. Hmm. Yeah. How much do they cost? About $1,000. About $1,000 okay. a piece. And, and there's a tablet that you use with it too. So that's about, okay. I don't know, $300. $300. What's, the, what's the backlog to get about, more? Right now it's about four months. Okay. Is there a substitute? There are other devices, but we haven't found anything that does this and does it that well. There's some stuff for conference. I guess I should yeah. talk into the mic. I know better than that. Um, there are some conference room uh, style equipment, but they're, they're not as good. They're made for people sitting at a desk. They're not made for the dynamic teacher that's up and around in their right. classroom that's in engaging with students. The other thing about the swivel that's really great is that when you have a hybrid classroom, you get these things called markers. There's the primary marker the teacher wears, and that's what the device follows. There are four other markers that act as microphones that you can place around the room so that you can do collaborative work, but also so you can pick up the questions from the other students in the classroom so the hybrid students can hear what's going on. So, and that's a unique piece that they have that I haven't seen with anybody else yet. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So it's our intent to continue to pursue those, you know, post-COVID, it's still, you, sometimes you have long uh, hospital stays and different pieces like that that would be very key, key to helping us with. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next up we have item 3.4. This is an action item. This is our consideration of contract ratification. Mr. Mr. Chair. 3.3, we'll come back to 3.3. Oh, I'm Shining sorry, yeah, let's do 3.3 first. Okay, Shining, Shining Stars. stars. For, um, Laura Peel, I don't, do not believe is here tonight. Is that correct, everyone? <clears throat> So our first shining star is Laura Peel, which Melissa mentioned her assistance uh, tonight, which was very key in these uh, remote learning situations. Laura joined the MPS team in 2019 as the manager of instructional technology and media. In this position, Laura oversees the media centers and MPS schools across the district. Laura earned her bachelor's of science degree from Central Michigan University in 1993 and her master's degree in library and information studies from Florida State University in 2002. Before coming to MPS, Laura was a member of the Saginaw Valley State University staff for 15 years. Laura was nominated for a shining star by an MPS colleague. Among their comments were the following. Laura goes above and beyond in her role as a media technologist. She is kind, caring, and supportive of our needs. She makes our job so much easier by taking the tedious jobs upon herself so that we can focus on the media center duties. She streamlines book orders, doing the legwork needed to add reviews which is a time-consuming job <clears throat> involving a lot of research and data entry. She single-handedly finds and utilizes our building resources to prioritize book orders for the media centers. She's always upbeat, even when I feel like I am bothered to her <laughs> with a bunch of questions. She never makes you feel like a question is stupid or irrelevant, always making sure we get a prompt and easily understood answer. She facilitates the learning in a comprehensive, enjoyable manner, even when hosting professional development meetings. She truly enjoys her role, supports us in every way, and cares about us people, not just coworkers. She has made my job much easier, creating a true, collaborative, inclusive, and work environment. Congratulations to Laura. My second, second shining star, makes me look good all the time, and she promised me I couldn't make her come up and stand or else I would. <laughs> so it is, it is Penny Miller Nelson. Uh, Penny joined the MPS team in 2008 as the Career and Technical, Technical Education Coordinator. In 2014, her position was realigned into the Coordinator of Secondary Instruction. In 2018, Penny was promoted to the position of Associate Superintendent for Curriculum, Instruction, and Assessment. She earned her bachelor's degree from Michigan State University in 1996, her master's degree from Michigan State University in 2001, and her education specialist degree from Saginaw Valley State University in 2006. It's hard to say. It is, it is. <laughs> <laughs> she knows how my bias is there. Penny was nominated for a shining star by an MPS colleague. Among their comments were the following. 
Penny has a work ethic like none other. During her three years at NPS Associate Superintendent, she always leads by example. Here are just a few of the major initiatives she has led in, her, in just three short years. STEM strategic plan and project lead the way launch and operation. Social emotional learning team up and running with implementation of emotional supports for students. Launched the district's pre-primary center with two different four-year-olds preschool programs. Worked with her team in strategizing implementing interventions to assist in closing the student achievement gaps continues to lead the district school improvement process, provides oversight for annual staff development pro proposals, and the list goes on and on. In her first year as associate superintendent, Penny traveled to Kenya as part of our district leadership team. That experience officially launched the MPS diversity, equity, and inclusion journey. Penny has been the leader, thinker, implementer, and so much more for this vital district work. The district's DEI immersion has sometimes been uncomfortable and often made us stretch and grow as a district. This is not always easy with many different viewpoints and voices, but Penny leads the district's equity and inclusion charge with her outstanding character, positive rapport with all MPS stakeholders, patience and empathy for all involved. This is long, but it's worth it, guys. <laughs> okay, now let's talk about Penny's leadership, specifically during the COVID years of 2020 and 2021. In March 2020, with one day notice from the governor, the state of Michigan shuttered our schools and moved all K-12 students to full remote learning. From the beginning of the closure, Penny and her team encouraged and supported teachers to put learning opportunities in place for students to continue to have connections with their teachers. After the initial two-week closure, the governor quickly moved K-12 schools to full remote learning for the remainder of the school year. Penny and her team rolled up her sleeves and spent hours and hours developing the continuity of learning plan. As a matter of fact, the NPS CLP was used by many districts as a model and template throughout the state. It was a very tough time for NPS students, staff, and families. Penny and her team were supportive, encouraging, and did all they could to lead the charge to keep learning connections between teachers and students happening and meaningful. Throughout it all, the key outcomes and emphasis for Penny and her team was the care and well-being of all students and staff. Now jump ahead to the 2021 school year. The state tasked districts determining whether our students would begin the year face-to-face -face learning, virtual learning, or hybrid approach. Once it was determined, Midland Public Schools would make all three learning approaches available to all K-12 students again. Penny and her team developed and led the way to make teaching and learning as imp impactful as possible in all three learning environments. It would have been much easier if the district had chosen just one learning method, but from the results of a parent poll last summer, it was evident that all three learning approaches were requested and needed. We knew that for the learning approach to be successful for the 2021 school year, especially knowing that there were, was a real possibility in having to pause from face-to-face -face learning because of COVID numbers, NBS had to adopt a robust virtual learning platform. Penny's team researched, implemented, and then conducted many, many staff trainings for Canvas, the virtual platform NPS has adopted. During this time of fear and uncertainty, Penny's exceptional leadership guided the district to embrace the changes in teaching and learning necessary to navigate the unprecedented 2021 school year. Through it all, Penny leads with courage, conviction, passion, empathy, and patience. She works tirelessly and has the best answer of all Midland Public School students and staff, always in front of everything she does. Penny's a joy to work with, and with NPS, so fortunate to have her executive leadership role of Associate Superintendent Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. Congratulations, Penny. Way to go, Penny. Thank you. All right, Mike, 3.4. I recommend that the board approve this collective bargaining agreement with the MCEA for the 21, 22, 22, 23 school years. The details of this agreement was presented to the Board of Education last month, as you know. Okay. I move on. to approve item 3.4, consideration of contract ratification. Support. Motion by Pam, support by Phil. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, we are at item four, request to address the board. And we have a number of you here tonight. Uh, the board understands that there are very strong feelings 
on both sides of the decision to pause athletics and face-to-face -face learning. Um, we welcome your opinions, comments, and criticisms, and we look forward to hearing from each and every one of you that have requests to address the board tonight. Um, please remember, folks, that we will not be engaging in open dialogue. If there is a question that requires a response, we will get you a written response as soon as we're able to. Also, um, because we have such a large number of people wanting to speak tonight, please be mindful of the five minute timer that Mr. Jaster will start when you approach the podium or when you begin to speak. And please folks, keep your comments respectful. Uh, that's all I have to say uh, to that end. And with that, um, I would like to call the floor Allison Reynolds. <coughs> And Mike, is there still a requirement to state name and address, or is that done on a slip? Either way. Okay. Either way. Good evening. I think this is on. Um, my name is Allison Reynolds. I am the daughter of a Michigan public school teacher for 25 years until her death from a very specific cancer for which there was no medical treatment, so she couldn't return to the classroom. She would have done anything to return to her students in the Troy schools, where for 25 years she led this special education program. I am a product of the Michigan public school system all the way up through Michigan State University um, and graduate school as well in public school. Didn't go to private school until I went to law school. I was also a student athlete. There's not one memory that I have of my school experience that isn't tied to my experience, both as an athlete as well as a student. And I am the proud parent of a student athlete in the Midland Public Schools. In the five minutes that I have, I wanted to share a couple of statistics that I think are important, share some of my concerns, and make some requests. First, some statistics. As of today, April 19th at 3.30, 24.54% of Midland County 16 to 19 year olds have already gotten their first COVID vaccine after only being able to get it for two weeks. Our teenagers are going to continue to pull our society forward on issues including racial justice, the environment, and science. And these should be celebrated and they should not be shamed for it. Our kids are going to save us. They're going to lead the way on all these important issues, these difficult issues. Contrast these numbers with the vaccination rates in Michigan's nursing homes, according to, and this is the staff of the nursing homes, and this is according to the president and CEO of their own union, who was very forthcoming, Melissa Samuel, in speaking to Cranes Detroit on April 7th, acknowledged that despite 40% of the U.S. COVID deaths occurring in nursing homes, Despite having the vaccine available to them for months, only 45% of nursing home workers have chosen to be fully vaccinated. Our students who, don't, who need their parents' permission, who have to drive mostly to Saginaw in the first two weeks, have already gotten 25% of them their first dose. And lastly, respectfully, on April 9th, Superintendent Shero made the decision to suspend MPS middle and high school sports for two weeks based on a positivity rate of one to two percent. And this was determined by the fact that Mr. Shero acknowledged that only five of the spring student athletes tested positive. And the number of students tested, we had to estimate by adding up the rosters of the teams because we made a request for the numbers from the board and understandably you have a lot of emails, we didn't get it. But if 250 to 500 student athletes were tested, only five of them came back positive, that's a one to 2% positivity rate. And still, those students were targeted, and in addition to having their learning disrupted, again, now they weren't able to, to play the sports that they were so eager to play. In light of these statistics, let me say this in defense of our young people and our MPS students, athletes in particular. It has been 13 months since our kids' worlds were turned upside down. That is one-tenth of their public school K-12 K through 12 experience, one-tenth. These teenagers have been accused by our society of being selfish and self-centered, of being responsible for the death of their grandparents because they wanted to go to school, play sports, and see their friends. 
Locally, they were blamed and continue to be blamed for the increase in our community's COVID numbers. And our student athletes, who have always been leaders in our community in grades, in volunteerism, in college attendance, were, again, respectfully, specifically targeted by our superintendent. It was this action on April 9th that caused me to join other MPS parents and students in calling upon this school board to overturn Mr. Shero's decision. I was disappointed and the school board did not agree to hold emergency meetings pursuant to board policy when we crested by Trustee Blasey. However, I was grateful and expressed my gratefulness to the board for your decision on April 12th to allow spring student athletes to resume such an important part of their normal lives today. Through the communications and my involvement around this issue, I have learned that MPS teachers and staff vaccination rates are estimated, and we heard today, at 70 to 80 percent, and that MPS administration does not know which MPS staff and teachers have been fully vaccinated. As a result, when a student tests positive in their classroom, these MPS staff and teachers are being included as close contacts and made to quarantine. Um, teachers, along with healthcare workers, were given. I, I'm going to have to ask you to stop. I, I apologize. We do have a number of people, and we're, okay. we're going to stick to five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Michael Glacken. I'll speak quickly since there seems to be a rigid application to the timing rule. Uh, my name is Michael Glacken. I am the father of three children. My daughter graduated uh, from Dow High. My son will graduate from Dow High this year, though his younger brother will not get to see him go through ceremony. I have one more son to send through the system, and I'm not so sure that he's gonna be a graduate of either Dow or Midland High. You mean well. There's a hidden allure to pursue the abundance of caution policy approach. It is easy, it is not controversial. It allows you to avoid balancing short-term benefits versus long-term consequences. And you can do it all under the umbrella of a friendly moniker. COVID has only enhanced the allure and our governing officials have refined the superficial and fleeting appeal of this approach to an art form. Again, it is easy, packaged as safe, and uncontroversial. But despite its prolific use, I never thought it would be the brand of the Midland Public School System. There is lip service to caring about students' mental health, their education experience, and their ability to compete for a better livelihood. But at the end, you filter it all out and resort to the easy, the safe, and the uncontroversial. But abundance of caution can be rec a reckless risk-taking enterprise. It comes with substantial costs when it comes to education. So maybe to appeal to the inclinations and proclivity of the easy, the safe, and on the, on the uncontroversial, you need convincing that in-person school allows you to take that same path. Let's start with the perspective and dispel the distorted or forgotten history that I'm sure you might hear tonight that students have lost just two weeks. Not true, that is a myth. They lost the majority of their second semester last year and the education offered during that time hardly could be called adequate, let alone stellar without parents' intervention. Moreover, in-person students have been frequently quarantined throughout the school year, pausing their in-person learning on a regular basis and stunting their academic progress. Last night, I learned of one high school student who has been quarantined four times this year. Add that to the past week, to this week, to the spring semester of 2020, and you tell me that it's just two weeks. And then consider the broader community, the communication of April 12th, which set a standard of 22 COVID cases of being the cross the Rubicon moment of closure. And you are left to conclude that the schools will not reopen or will once again be paused. And I sure hope we get some clarity on those two communications tonight because to put it bluntly and politely, the two of them together amounted to what my dad would call a dog's breakfast. 
In-person learning is superior to even today's best virtual offerings. Your own material states that. And what our face-to-face -face students receive as virtual learning while quarantined on a pause cannot be called learning or an online education, unless you are mapping the application of Orwellian language to the situation. How about some recent examples from my two sons during the past week? My eighth grader was not, uh, uh, my, my son started his first day, senior, at a class at 11.53. My eighth grade son, not to be denied the equal opportunity that education, did not get math, did not get science, and had no English. Don't tell me that my kids are being educated without math, science, and English. In the interest of time, I want to jump ahead and talk about what our true elites are saying at the Cleveland Clinic and Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins, Marty McCary. I strongly encourage school boards, members, parents, and local government leaders to find a path to reopen quickly because precautions have kept pilots, flight attendants, and airline passengers safe for millions of times over despite a smaller space, a higher density of people congregating together, and a higher risk population than our kids. That's what Johns Hopkins says. I think that Johns Hopkins is the platinum standard. Cleveland Kinnick has also encouraged the schools to reopen. Lastly, I want to conclude with Midland Public Schools have enjoyed a monopoly at the high school level. That landscape is changing. You either choose Dow or Midland High. People are now going to be allowed to live in a different place where they work. So your new competition is Chicago New Trier, Detroit Catholic Central, Detroit Cranbrook, Brother Rice, Forest Hills. And it takes Midland Public Schools' best day to even compete with those schools. But the one way you cannot compete with those schools is when those doors are closed and theirs are open. Thank you, Mr. Blacken. Mr. Jeff Pitt. I'm Jeff Pitt, live here in Midland, grew up in Michigan, University of Michigan graduate. I have a special needs son at a high school and a son who's not special needs at the other high school. I'm here to discuss the pause and I'm gonna make three quick points. First, per the Americans with Disabilities Act, state and local government agencies must make reasonable modifications to allow people with disabilities to access goods and services they offer. This does not end with a pandemic. The DHHS, the local Department of Health, cannot invalidate that law. MPS has not met the three reasons under the ADA that a state or local government agency may not have to provide reasonable modification. You haven't done it. Fundamental alteration, not there. Undue burden to you, not there. Direct threat of the special needs community to everyone else, not there. Second, you are once again adversely affecting the students in the trades classes. Welding and auto tech over Zoom is no way equivalent to in-person learning. You have multiple options available to you to keep those students in person and choose not to do that. How will you make up for this lost kind of time? At least one student in the trades has a 504 plan. Gee, I wonder whose son that is. And I believe the ADA also requires you to make up for his lost time. Do you have a plan to do that? What about the rest of the students in those classes? At this time, I have to disagree with Superintendent Sherrill in that reducing learning time by 60% is not in the best interests of our students. And any educator who agrees with that, I believe, may be in the wrong profession. Loss of in-person welding time is a hundred percent reduction in learning. Not 60, 100. How can you consider that the students completed the work and actually learned the material and deserve to be moved on if they're not able to actually weld in class? Third, 
MPS stated in the recent email that in-person learning pause was for health and safety of students. And this is my ballywick. I'm going to give you some stats. Although you may actually believe that, according to the CDC, you're not increasing student safety at all. COVID is not even the top 10 threat to our children. In the last year, the data is available, 2018, over 2,500 children ages 13 to 19 were killed in car crashes. Since March of 2020, 1,051 children ages 0 to 17 were killed by COVID-19. The risk to our children is greater than two and a half times more driving to and from school every day in every school-sponsored event. And yet, you don't care. You let it happen for convenience sake. Nothing concerned about health and safety of the children. You're picking the low-hanging fruit that does nothing instead of making this serious, the, the, the more adverse, I guess you could say, decision to say, students ride the bus. That's the safest form of transportation. That's what keeps them alive. And not just alive, students are 100 times more likely to be hospitalized because of a car crash than because of COVID. That's where your risk is, not from COVID. And so the CDC has also stated in multiple publications that number one, school transmission is minimal especially when you're doing what you're doing, masking and social distancing. This is supported by countless studies in Europe. Number two, transmission of COVID is primarily where? In the home. 70% of transmissions occur where? In the home. Where did you put our kids? In the home. Granted, it's only for another six to eight hours a day, but still. If you're trying to minimize risk and increase health and safety, they should be in school and not exposed to their parents who have COVID. The CDC has identified the comorbidities. Besides age, this is an age-related disease. Not, that's the first and foremost problem. The other, the comorbidities are diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, chronic pulmonary disease. Of course, that's all if you're older, my age most of your ages. If you have students whose parents are worried about it, let them stay home. Let them have their classes on Zoom. Let the rest of our kids go to school. In conclusion, we chose to follow the DHS policy who do, whose leader doesn't follow their own policy. And I will stop instead of keep talking like Mike. Thank you, Mr. Pitt. Uh, next, we have Ms. Jennifer Seymour. Hello, my name is Jen Seymour. I come to you as a registered nurse, a mom of four that are attending MPS, and a concerned community member. I work for MidMichigan Health as a home care RN, and I also work at Covenant Health Systems in one of their ICUs. I do take COVID very seriously. I have taken care of many COVID patients and understand the impact of this virus on them. These last almost 14 months have negatively impacted all of us. The effects of this virus are real and I understand it. COVID isn't just affecting people that contract it, but it's affecting everyone. I'm grateful a decision was made to let sports resume this week, which is very important to our kids, especially when last spring they had no sports. But I'm also here to vo voice my concerns over their education or lack of it. A decision on April 9th was abruptly made to pause our children from getting the education that they deserve. I understand that the transmission rates are high. However, MPS has never has taken the necessary steps and invested a lot of money on safety protocols to ensure that our children can safely attend face-to-face. -face. I believe with the safety protocols that are in place, MPS has created an environment where face-to-face -face can occur safely. The Canvas platform that is utilized is great if used properly. I am familiar with this platform as I utilize it through SVSU myself. Many of the teachers are using it differently and not as effective as it could be. This has always been a frustration from day one with this canvas. 
This leads to confusion with the students. Our children simply aren't getting the education they deserve. I know it may look like it's appropriate, but it just simply is not. Three classes a day, four days a week, and 20 minutes on Fridays of virtual isn't adequate. In my opinion, that's my opinion on that. I'm really not sure how anyone could say that standard. Many times I have witnessed my children's teachers having them on virtual for five minutes and tell them if they have any questions, they can stay on and discuss it with them or they can be excused from their class. A 55 minute class period turns into only five minutes. This leads to these students teaching themselves and not understanding the required material. In many situations, parents are trying to balance their work life and making sure that their children are doing their schoolwork. Since this has been going on for over a year with some schools doing virtual teaching, there has been an increase in depression, anxiety, and suicide. Our kids want to be in person with their peers. They are tired of having in-person school taken away from them when they are healthy. You gave my options for parents to choose virtual, hybrid. You gave many options for parents to choose virtual, hybrid, and face-to-face. -face. There is no re reason that we aren't face-to-face -face if that option is what we chose. If parents don't want their fa kids face-to-face, -face, then they should be opting for virtual. Shutting down schools is not going to lower the transmission rate. These cases are going to continue to rise and fall for many more months. Unfortunately, COVID is here to stay. Eventually, we will get the cases down, but until then, we need to start learning to live with it. One could make the argument the reason we were seeing the rises in the cases is because we have been shut down for so long. The CDC states that K through 12 should be the last setting to close and the first to reopen when it can do so safely. I am confident that MPS have all the safety protocols in place to reduce the spread of the virus. I know many may disagree with the how safe it is. Those parents were given the option to choose virtual. Mr. Sherrill made a comment in, our, in his communicate on April 9th that the lawyer said our district could be sued if we continue to go face to face. So are you saying all these other wonderful school districts that remain face-to-face -face are opening themselves up to a lawsuit? From my understanding, that is why parents were given options with face-to-face, -face, virtual, or hybrid learning, and that the school districts were given immunity against lawsuits. This was not a mandate. It was a recommendation by Governor Whitmore. Just because it's a recommendation doesn't mean it's a good one, especially when statistically it has been proven that kids not going face to face causes many negative impacts on our children. When you make these decisions abruptly and disregard these issues, it's a huge concern among us parents. This pause needs to end this Friday and not be extended, even if the governor recommends it to stay as a pause. As far as sports, the CDC recognizes that this is a necessary, this, as far as sports the, to continue, the CDC recognizes that this is necessary for our kids and outside sports can be done safely. There should be no reason that any outside sport to shut down as long as everyone is healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Ms. Lisa Hansen. Well, as it turns out, my font was not big enough. So <laughs> I, uh, I'm here. My name is Lisa Hansen, and my daughter goes to Dow High. I'm sure she's thrilled that you all know that. Um, but I'm really just here to make my presence known. And I just really believe that you made the decision in the fall to get our kids back to school and that you need to stick with it. You need to trust that you made that environment safe for our kids because our kids deserve to know that they're in a safe environment. Parents that are living in fear and choose not to send their kids to school have the choice. But we have rights and we made the decision as a family, educated, what was best for our child. So I really am truly here because I'm kind of guessing that you probably don't get a lot of thank yous right now. And I'm here to tell you thank you for getting our kids back to school. And now I expect them to stay in school because it's what's best for them. So I really am here to just be present. You know, I knew a year ago that the time would come that I would need to take a stand. And I have been quietly educating myself for a year so that when the time came, I could do it confidently. 
I am no longer willing to let somebody shame or guilt me into compliance. You put things in place to make our school safe. You need to stand on that and you need to keep our kids in school. And I want you to know that you have my support on that because you're gonna take a lot of heat from other parents that are still living in fear. COVID is here, it's real, and we gotta deal with it. But sticking our kids in virtual and changing everything up, these kids need consistency. They need to know they're safe and they need to know that their leaders are going to protect them. So as a parent, I am just here to say, there is inherent risk in every single thing that we do in this world. And um, our kids have a 99% survival rate. So as the parent of, I love my kid more than anything, just like you all love your kids, I'm willing to take a 1% risk. These kids need to know that they have our support and they need to know that we're here to protect them. And I know that there are a lot of people out there living in fear of COVID, but I'm not one of them. So I just want everybody on the board and I want you to know that you have my support. I've got your back when you keep our kids in school because it's exactly where they belong to be. <sighs> because there's a lot of, you know, I'm a graduate of Dow High many, many moons ago. And uh, there is a, common sense is not so common anymore. But we have transitioned into this place now where we have common sense and COVID sense. And I need you all to use your common sense for our kids. There's a difference. The truth is being suppressed and censored and I'm not buying into it anymore. So I am just here as a citizen in this county because you know what? We're neighbors, this is our community and we need to work together. And I just wanna be very clear that as long as you've got my kids back, I've got your back. And I know that you're gonna get hit from a lot of people. You're gonna take a lot of heat. And I just wanted to come here today to make sure that you understand that this room right here, we've got your back because our kids need some consistency. This is unbelievable. And I also wanna say thank you to the parents that uh, organized the rally last week because I didn't know when I was gonna take my stand, but you gave me the opportunity. So I'm here to take my stand and I wanna thank these courageous, bold parents that pulled these people together. And I wanna be very clear with who I am. There's no gray area. I think it's time everybody's picked their lane. I've picked my lane and I'm in it to win it. And I am all about the kids. And I learned two things about myself this past week. One is that my blood, runs red, white, and blue. And I am not gonna allow, not on my watch, are our civil liberties gonna be taken away under the guise of COVID. And the other thing I learned about myself is that I'm not gonna run away from it, I'm gonna run toward it. So I want you to see me, I want you to know who I am, because I'm involved. <laughs> I never wanted to come to a school board meeting, never had a plan, <laughs> but I'm here, and you're gonna see me every stinking time, whether you want to or not. And I also want the parents in this room to know that uh, I'm ready to fight, and whoever's ready to fight with me for our kids, these things are ridiculous, but that's another fight. So I'm gonna leave you with a quote. My mom sent this quote to me a couple years ago, and uh, I think it's good for all of us. Few will be legends, but we can all leave a legacy. And mine starts today, because I'm taking a stand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Next, we have Lisa McGuff. Did I say that right, Lisa? OK, thank you. Hi, Mike, thank you. We'd, we'd prefer Lisa, but. <laughs> uh, let's see, um, just a couple comments. I, I uh, First off, I do appreciate everything the school board's doing. Uh, you guys are in a tough spot trying to make the best decisions you can. Uh, as a lot of you know, um, I've been a part of this community for 30 years. Now I'm the CEO of a company down in Ohio, a public company. I'm also on the board of a prominent uh, hospital in Cleveland. <clears throat> it's been really helpful to figure out what's going on with COVID. But a couple of things I really wanted to talk about, really was just three asked, and I talked to a few board members and said, I really want to keep, how do we move it forward together? You know, you guys are faced with constituent groups that you're going to be criticized no matter what you do. And I, I'm there, like every decision I make at work, there's a third of the people who don't like it and hopefully two thirds who do. So I, I, I live that every day. One thing I'd ask is on the, um, the situation around the quarantine kids, I think what would be really helpful is I know we've got two of these machines that scan the teachers and it's pretty cool. 
two. I don't know how many classrooms do we have, a thousand, something like that. I, I talked to a group of kids, Dow High kids, over my house before I left, and I said, hey, what should I ask for? And they said, well, just ask for, um, put a phone on, put an iPhone on, put anything on so that the quarantine kids can hear what's going on in a classroom. I know you were told that there was a lot of whiz-bang technology. I, I've, I've had three kids quarantined almost three times. That's not going on. Please know that. That's not going on at all. The this instruction of your quarantine kids is virtually zero. Mike Glacken said that you wake up at 11, they do a class, and they're done for the day. It's, it's, it's actually poor. So that would be my one ask is help me with the quarantine kids. Um, second is the, the SAT and PSAT. As many of you know, I volunteered at Wendover School for almost 10 years with Lolita Pfeiffer, and then I volunteered at MPS almost 20 years through Junior Achievement. The kids on the margin are the ones that my heart cares the most about. And these are the kids that are having 900 SAT that need to get 1,000, or they have 1,000 SAT that need to get 1,100. They typically take the test one time, and their one time to take it right now is slated to be the day after they come back from two weeks of no instruction or virtual instruction or video games. You can't ask a kid who's on the margin to run a marathon when they've been sitting on the couch for two weeks. So what I'd ask, please, I know there's a May opportunity that's COVID related. Give the kids a shot to take the SAT or PSAT on either April or May. For the kids that are high performing and they want to be national merit finalists, this is a big deal. They can't come in cold and take a national test against national students who have been in person instruction. It just won't, it won't resonate. I care so deeply about the school, I want my Wendover kids, I want my marginal kids to have every shot of opportunity to get into that junior college, to get into to, to the, uh, to the lower level oh. schools, and they need those SAT scores, and they typically don't have the money to take the test twice. So push it to May, I know you can, I know you can. So I'd encourage you to do that. And again, now, as I say before, I, uh, I, I'm really, I'm really cautious with being that firm with you all because I'm in your shoes every day. I know everybody, like I said, everybody disagrees with the decisions I make at work. A lot of people love them. But one area I wanted to share, and I see I got a minute 30 left, is the get the kids back to school because there's a mental impact of it. And I'll share with you a story today. Um, I, was, I was at home, I was staying home. I wanted to be at this board meeting. And uh, the DECA international competition is going on right now. It's going on virtual. It's a big deal, DECA Internationals. We had four uh, HHDAO uh, juniors and seniors in our basement trying to do DECA Internationals. They're dressed up, they got their ties on, their adrenaline's pumping, they're ready to do this against people from all countries to do this DECA pitch. Big deal. <clears throat> they log on, they get their password, the computer won't connect because the MPS firewall blocks them. So you talk about mental anguish, and these kids are stressed out. They're trying, they, they hook up their phones. There's feedback. They can't talk. They can't get their phone to stick. The password doesn't work. They try to record. It goes off. They try to record again. It goes off. They finally get it through after four times. <clears throat> and my son is a wreck because he's a manager at Cottage Creamery. He's trying to figure out how does he get to his job to open the store because of all this nonsense that's going on. And it's not the board's fault. That's COVID, right? That's COVID in a good IT department. Um, but but uh, uh, ultimately, they got it through, and then they realized in all the hubbub, they failed to mention their secret password to prevent them from recording it earlier than otherwise. And so they're probably going to get DQ'd. So this is the type of nonsense. We've got to get these kids back in school, please. The people who don't want to come back in had the option to go hybrid. They had uh, the option to stay home. They had the option to do it virtual. Our kids chose the option to be in school. And I'd, I'd ask you guys to please figure out a way as soon as we can, ideally Monday, to get the kids back in school. And, and again, I've got total respect for you all as a board. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Axel Fisher. Hi, Axel. Thanks for coming in. Hi. My name's Axel Fisher, and I'm a senior at Midland High School. And this year, I'm taking five AP classes. 
Last Tuesday, I spent 20 minutes on Zoom calls. 20 minutes for five AP classes. That does not approach acceptable educational standards. And you know, I keep hearing from people, oh, it's okay, because we're all in this together. It's all relative. You're competing against other people. That works in the short term, but eventually bridges have to be built. Plants have to be run. And I'd like to think that the guy building my bridge, designing my bridge, attended a full year of AP physics. <laughs> That's just something I like to think when I go to bed at night. The CDC, the banner carrier for safetyism in this country, says that it is okay with acceptable precautions for kids to be in school. When Gretchen Whitmer put out her suggestion that we go virtual, we got two responses from the board and the administration. The first one from the administration said that we don't want to get sued. I applaud them for their honesty. I really question their priorities. Is the first priority of MPS to avoid lawsuits? I really hope that's not true. The second communique that came from the Board of Education put out a lot of statistics, but not the one that counts. Are cases being transmitted within the schools? And science across America says that it is not. Uh, even our own Midland County Health Department says that our schools are safer than our community. So how does it make sense to take students for eight hours a day and take them from our schools and put them into our community? It doesn't. And that, that, that's, where, that's where I'm really sad because nobody along the chain had the gumption to stand up and say we want to keep our kids in school because we know it's the right thing to do. It's sad. It's really sad that that's where we've reached at this point in America. How can Midland Public Schools claim to be a premier school district, which I've always felt it was. I've always felt like Midland Public Schools is preparing students very well for their future of education. But how can we claim to be a premier school district when our AP students are spending 20 minutes a day in Zoom calls and other schools across the state are in person? We can't. And quite frankly, if this is how we're going to educate our students, we deserve to lose students to private schools because parents should educate their children the best they can. I don't want to see that happen to Midland Public Schools. My family has been involved in Midland Public Schools for almost 20 years now. It's been good to us. But I want, I think that parents should be able to educate their children the best they can. I've heard a lot in the past 13 months about caring for people about how it's time for us to look out for people. Well, I'm wondering, who here is looking out for the kid who's on the knife edge of graduation and now who's not going to graduate because of online school? It's not the people who made this decision. Who here is looking out for the kid who is now thrust into a bad situation at home for eight more hours a day? Not the people who made this decision. As youth suicide rates across this country skyrocket, who here is looking out for children with deteriorating mental health? No, not people in this room. They may pay tangential lip service to mental health in a passing communique, but if they actually cared, they would do what's best for our students, and they would put them back in school. They have failed our society, they have failed our community, and most importantly, they have failed and are failing our students. And that's unacceptable if we want to be a community that prides ourselves on educating our students well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Christine Bowerson. Hi, Christine. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you in regards to the two-week school closure for the 
older grades in Midland Public Schools. My name is Christine Bowerson. I'm the mother of eight children, and I currently have three kids in the Midland Public Schools, a ninth grader, a 10th grader at Dow, and 11th grader at Midland High School. I'm here to express my concern and disappointment in another two weeks of loss of learning and to insist that the schools remain open for the rest of the year and beyond. I'm also here to speak on behalf of all children as I have a student in the general education classes, a student in the co-taught classroom environment, and also one who is an ESA special education student, uh, yet he also attends some general education classes as well. So many students, especially for those with disabilities, the most important part of their school day cannot be addressed on a device. The social skills, problem solving, hands-on, functional academics, and independence cannot be addressed on a Chromebook. My special needs son is in the 11th grade and has already lost out on so many experiences and important learning opportunities because of the amount of time he's been forced onto a Chromebook this past year. And now you've sent him home again. He needs this in-person learning so he can have the skills it takes to live independently, work at a job, and succeed past high school. The CBI portion, which is community-based instruction, allows him and others to work in Midland at various businesses to learn work skills, gain confidence, being out working in the community, and understand what it's like to work at a real job, yet have the support and care of a parapro with him. He's already been severely reduced because of COVID restrictions, and now you're eliminating the opportunity to work in the classroom and in school too. His teacher has been very creative in trying to give him and his classmates some of these experiences, but when they are sent home to learn virtually, they get none of this. You can't replace any of this learning sitting in front of a computer. And have you thought about what this is doing to students with learning and or physical disabilities that makes it difficult for them to participate in online classes? Students with slower processing skills, hearing and speech issues, and other cognitive impairments are unable to learn effectively on a Zoom call. These students are being isolated from their peers and denied a learning environment that helps to compensate for these disabilities. These kids are being forced into a learning environment that doesn't meet their individual education plans, doesn't give the hands-on learning and interactive learning they receive from their teachers and paras, nor the socialization and support they get from their classmates. When you made this decision to shut down the schools for two weeks, did you even consider that many parents have to work and were unable to drop everything at the last minute to help our students? You're allowing a large part of the student body to fall through the cracks by taking away their in-person learning option. I'm here to tell you that every family I know, their children are really struggling with virtual learning. My children aren't different, any different. Sitting in front of a computer trying to learn a subject without being able to comfortably ask a question, and you've all done that on Zoom calls, remain quiet because it's awkward to ask a question, or get in-person feedback or help from their teacher and having to wade through school assignments in six different locations in a program is frustrating and defeating. What I don't understand is your change in your stance on opening the schools up and keeping them open. At the beginning of the school year, Midland Public Schools spent millions of dollars for equipment to reopen. The doorway and bus thermometers, the plastic shields, social distancing rules, face masks, etc. All the educators, staff, and everything were some of the first to be able to have the option to get vaccinated. Yet here we are keeping the older kids out of the schools and denying our kids the right to an in-person education that our tax dollars pay for. The parents should be able to make the decision whether or not they feel comfortable having their children in school, and you should continue with the three schooling options. The part of this that upsets me the most is the decision to allow the athletes to return to participating in sports after only one week off, but keeping the schools closed for two weeks. According to the school newsletter, it states, and I quote, it was overwhelmingly evident that the vast majority of students and parents' guardians who reached out to MPS board members and the superintendent this past weekend have been most concerned about the two-week pause in athletics. After careful consideration of all the impassioned pleas MPS received, we offer the following compromise to MPS secondary student athletes, which then goes on to say that students can return to their sports after one week of a pause, yet our children could not return to the classroom to learn. So the board and superintendent made the decision to deny our children in-person learning because not enough people complained about it when you originally came up with the idea? I didn't realize that I had to beg, plead, and harass the school board in order for them to allow my children to be educated in person. It's apparent to me where the priorities are at the Midland Public School District, athletics. And if begging and pleading makes a difference in getting our kids back in the school, consider it done. Thank you. Thank you.
9.30. Oh, we can wait. Not until 9.30. It's, it's 9 o'clock right now. We can yeah. wait. Yeah. Thank you, though, John. Okay, next we have Miss Sarah Ladw Ladwine. Ladwin, sorry. Hi, uh, again, my name is Sarah Ladwin. I have uh, three boys, one at Jefferson and uh, two at Dow High. I wrote and rewrote pages and pages of thoughts that I wanted to say tonight, um, many of which I think have already been expressed, so I'm not going to waste your time since the late, you know, the night is getting late. One thing I think is really, really important that I'd like to speak to you at is that for parents, having that personal interaction with our children, I said I was going to do this, watching them struggle, not just trying to learn at home, but struggling to sit, I have a child with ADHD and a sensory processing disorder. Imagine that situation if it were yours with this on your face all day. And I said, honey, you can't do that. You can't go to school. He said, my mom, I'm so lonely. Okay. These are the choices that we're facing as parents every day with our kids. The lesser of the two evils. So I get emails constantly from his teachers that, your son's not paying attention in class. You need to get on him. I, I'm trying. All right? I have a senior who dreamed of swimming in college. Should have been on a state championship or maybe a relay team. They were ranked to do really well last year at Dow High. The day we were packing the car to go, no state meet. He's like, it's it. That's it. My dream's done. I'm never swimming in college. Then we don't get to practice all this year. So I understand um, for the woman who talked yesterday about being the parent of an athlete as well as being the parent of a student who has some special needs as well. They are all being hurt to varying degrees. And all we ask this board to do is listen to us with compassion and understand that we are doing the best we can, making the best decisions that we can for our children. And I respectfully ask that you respect our choices. I appreciate that you have offered hybrid and online courses. I think that's amazing because I do re recognize that parents have varying degrees of fear or not when it comes to the coronavirus. So for those of us who have chosen to allow our students to be in school, we understand that that is what is best for our students. I pray that you would let us take that option. You put it in front of us. You said you can go hybrid, you can go online, you can go in person. And so all we're asking is that you respect that our decision to have them go in person and let us do that. That is your job. There are many, many online platforms out there many who've been doing it for years and years and years, who probably have a little more streamlined than MPS and a half a year worth of experience. What we need MPS and what we need you for is the in-school part. That's what we can't get anywhere else right now. Athletics are important to the, the health of the kids, just the same as being in school and having those interactions. There's kids who've trained very hard their whole lives to try to get where they want to get for college aspirations. Some of them, maybe that's their only way that they're going to get to the colleges they want to go, go to. So I don't think we can discount that either. One last final thought that I'd like to leave you with. This mass antigen testing, I just want to caution that when there's a low prevalence within a community, such as children who have a very low chance of having the virus, those antigen tests can have a lot of false positives. And so I would request that before quarantining happening that there's some follow-ups with some more reliable testing, PCR. You can check um, online. There's a lot of information about the, the false positivity rates. Quarantining, my son was quarantined. And like so many other, he's a senior. Half of his classes are AP classes. Zero instruction. Zero. So I, again, want to reinforce the need to have th this camera right here. 
Some setup like that in every class has worked just fine. There should be no unfair treatment for kids who are forced to be quarantined versus the kids who are in class. They should all be able to learn seamlessly. The technology's there, even if we don't have fancy robots. So that's my final thought is just please understand your job, I pray, is to keep the schools open because those are the choices that we have made for the in-person learning scenario. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Ms. Carrie Gordon. Good evening. My name is Carrie Gordon. I'm the mother of three sons, two of whom have already graduated from Midland High School are both in university. One is going to be graduating within the month. I have another. My third son is finishing his, or well, yeah, finishing his junior year at Midland High. I'm here tonight, as so many parents are, to express my concerns over the recent compliance to a governor's suggestion that we should close our schools and shut down our sports for two weeks. Our kids are more than just physical beings. They're mental, they're emotional beings as well. Throughout this entire pandemic, most, if not all, of the precautionary measures that have taken place in school and out have focused on one aspect of their being, and that is physical. I would like to suggest to you that even from that physical standpoint, our children are safer in school, and we heard it from our health director this evening. The school district has gone above and beyond with the measures that they have put in place to keep our kids safe physically. Classes are socially distanced. Everyone has a mask. There's desk shields. They disinfect the desks and the desk shields. They have a monitored socially distanced lunchtime. Their temperatures are checked when they walk in the building. They're not able to go to their lockers between classes, measure after measure. In band, they have special masks. They have bell covers. They're not able to play for more than 30 minutes, and then the whole band room is disinfected. Physical precautionary measure after physical precaution after physical precaution. And hey, I'm not complaining because I have appreciated the lengths to which the school board has gone to make sure that our kids can go back to school face to face safely. But the school district is ignoring the mental and emotional impact and toll that this is having on our kids. And you might say that you're not, but your actions lately have spoken otherwise. Why on earth? when the school is one of the safest places that they could be, not just physically, but truly mentally and emotionally as well, would you send them home for two weeks? I gotta say, I find it interesting that in the first communique that the superintendent pointed, put out, he said, regarding the governor's recommendation, and I quote, although it seemed schools had an option of whether to do this, they really did not. According to our district lawyers, schools that do not pause these two activities will not be protected under government immunity, end quote. It puzzles me then how after learning that the parents were going to protest for the first time that a compromise, which was really no compromise at all for our students, was, Im was implemented. That makes the superintendent's first statement very dis seem, seem very dishonest. It gave me the sense that the school board was throwing out just enough of a bone to get the parents to drop it. But guess what? I hope you've seen by tonight we haven't dropped it. We're not going to drop it. We didn't drop it when multiple parents requested an emergency meeting and we were ignored. President Scott McFarland gave us the proper code to use in requesting an emergency meeting and we were ignored. Then board member Brad Blazy requested an emergency meeting and he was denied. Why? Why? Every single one of you board members is an elected official. And those of us in this room are the ones who put you there to make decisions on behalf of our children. Why would you not listen to the people who put you in those seats? Why would you ignore us? That makes zero sense. Did you think that by brushing this under the rug, we were going to go away? That we weren't going to show up at this meeting? That somehow we were going to lose the passion and the fervor for this fight? The fight for the holistic health of our children? I'll close with this. I hope what you as a school board are gleaning from tonight's meeting is that we as parents are paying attention. 
I'll go ahead and admit it myself. I have not been paying as much of attention as I should. I've just blindly trusted this school board and have not paid nearly as much attention to the meetings and the votes and the, deci the decisions that, has, that have been made. But that ends tonight. I, as well as many parents in this room, are going to be paying attention, and we are going to be watching how you vote on certain topics and what decisions you make, and you better believe that come election time, we will hold you accountable by the decisions that we make at the polls, and you, we will encourage everyone we know to make the right decision as well, because we expect more and we expect better. And Mr. Blasey, thank you for listening to us as parents and attempting to get the rest of the board to listen as well. Okay, we have Mr. Dan Murphy. Thank you everyone for uh, giving me this opportunity tonight, and all of us as well, and I feel uh, I better measure up. This has been a, a great uh, precursor um, to me, so I, I, like the others, are probably going to avoid giving you guys statistics and um, rationales and things of that nature that you've all heard and you've all re had regurgitated many times. We've all got a stat that we can look at. Um, I'm, a, I'm the parent of a, a current junior at Dow High, and I have a senior that graduated last spring. I just like to echo, I guess, some of the sentiments I think have been well put tonight. Um, first and foremost is, with all the technology we heard presented earlier, all the things that the kids have available, all these wonderful, you know, technological advancements that are in place for the virtual learning to occur. I've watched my kids both last year in the spring, which was tough, but we all sucked it up and we did it. And this year with, the, with, with either being quarantined or, you know, the, the pauses that have, that have taken place, Virtual learning is not a substitute for being in class. I frankly don't know how many people could ever accomplish much by learning that way. And I've watched my kids, like I heard Axel say, it's five to 10 minutes, it's 20 minutes. It's, it's a very low percentage of their time is actually being instructed. And you cannot substitute in-person learning, instruction with your teacher, interaction with your fellow students, um, the structure of getting up in the morning, getting ready for something, you know, they're preparing themselves for the future. And I'm very, very concerned as a parent that I see my kids not being ready for the future that lies ahead of them. And it's the job of the school system. It's the job of us as parents to make sure our kids get educated and have a future ahead of them. And as we heard from the, the health department, um, the school is the safest place to be. I've felt that a long time. Like Ms. Hansen said, I, I've kind of stood on the sidelines crossing my fingers, hoping that the rational people start making rational decisions. Um, see us all finally see our kids get back to normal. We thought, hey, just, just a little bit longer, just a little bit longer. Well, it's been 13, almost 14 months. I've seen my kids disengage. These, I got average kids, they're good students. They get A's, they get B's, they play sports. Sports is very, very important. I wish I was at my son's ball game tonight. Dow played at Mount Pleasant. Oh, I don't know what the outcome was. Um, but ultimately, I, I feel it's time to take a stand. It's time to not sit on the sidelines, show some courage, come out in front of everybody that I, I know many of you, I've, I've talked to many of you in the, in, in the past, and I respect your position, I respect the position you're in. I think ultimately it's a tough place to be. You're trying to balance risk, you're trying to balance the, uh, the fear that's out there and the concerns for the kids. And, and we heard it earlier, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ganoski said it. School is the best place for these kids to be right now. It's, I mean, I would say the measures that we've taken are above and beyond. And I would say that even though I prefer them to be in school in those measures, you know darn well that those are not comfortable environments for kids to be in, but the least they want to be there. I mean, my son's not the, his school is not his number one priority, I don't think, in life, but he definitely prefers to be in person far more than being virtual. And I watch him after two days of virtual, it's a waste of time. Um, he's a good kid, a good student who just loses motivation and loses interest, and that's got me really, really concerned, and I'm sure there's other kids who have the same problem. So I'm here to say I support you guys. I support the job you have to do, but it's the job of our school system to educate our kids, and they've got three options available to 
learn if they choose to, if parents are fearful of sending their kids to school. It's us, our parents have to make, be able to make the choice to send our kids to school or not. And we have, many of us have. And I feel very confident in the measures you've taken. And I've said, my wife and I have both said, it's safe for the kids to be in school. We don't have a fear that, that, that they're gonna be harmed there. And that's what we want and that's all we can ask for. But please, let them get back to school. Uh, let them get back to learning. They're paying a heavy price, a heavier price than many of us as adults are. We got lots of options as adults to navigate work and life. We can work virtual, we can work distance from dis distances and we can just make things happen even though it's difficult. These kids don't have that many options and their futures depend on this. Um, and I'm sorry, the last 14 months have not been the same learning environment that these kids really need to succeed, I don't think. And I've seen it firsthand and I've heard many parents. I've heard any parent tell me that they think, yeah, virtual school is the way to go. If it truly is, why would we ever go back to in-person? If, so, if it's so wonderful, why have the buildings and all the, all the other things, let's just have the kids sit in front of a screen. I can tell you, when a kid can black out the screen and a teacher can't see them, that kid's not engaged. And I've seen it firsthand in my house and I know other kids have done the same thing. Um, I applaud everybody for coming tonight. I applaud all of you for giving us the time. Um, we, like, like I heard earlier, we've got your back. We support the school board. We support the superintendent. We support Midland Public Schools. That's why we send our kids to Midland Public Schools. Uh, please keep the schools open. Please let them go back to school. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Uh, next we have Paul Phil. Mr. Paul Phil. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. I know this is going extended for you, so I'll keep my comments brief. Um, I came and spoke, uh, I have a, two students at uh, Dow High right now, a junior and a senior. And I came and spoke to you on October 27th to the board and basically said what's been said tonight, that uh, uh, school is the safest place for kids to be. We didn't have the data at that time. I told you guys to look at the Washtenaw experience. They were not going face to face and they still aren't. Uh, and compare it to you know what what we're going to see, but there are probably about 40 different studies now showing that what uh, Mr. Yanoski is uh, telling us we're experiencing that school is the safest place for kids. But my main comment tonight is, uh, as a person who's worked in uh, on the pediatric inpatient setting for the past 30 years, um, I've never seen anything like this year in terms of mental health, and it's far eclipsing the uh, morbidity and mortality that we're seeing. In, uh, from COVID for uh, kids under the age of 19. Um, we have seen uh, just some stats. I'm on the pediatric unit at Covenant every day. It's the only um, pediatric inpatient unit in the region. And we've seen um, a pretty clear uh, tripling in the number of suicide attempts uh, during the, the lockdown. And uh, if you uh, take a look at our numbers, uh, 2017, 2018, 2019, we're pretty much in the 26 to 30 uh, suicide attempts a year. And last year we saw 67 uh, suicide attempts in adolescence. And uh, you know, I, I brought that to your attention at that October 27th meeting and I said there, it's not unusual at this time for us to see two suicide attempts in one night. Well, shortly after that, we had three suicide attempts in one night. And just a couple weeks ago, we had four suicide attempts in one night. And, uh, 13 year olds uh, and 14 year olds. And that's another trend we've been seeing is the suicide attempts have been going uh, younger and younger. So the average age was 15.4 years uh, at the, uh, in 2017, and it's uh, slowly uh, trended down, but took a hockey stick uh, during 2020 down to uh, 14 and a half. So it, it's really dramatic and we can't, you know, that's something that you're not gonna hear. You kind of hear it nebulously in the nationwide data, but it's, it's hitting us right here. Uh, and I can't uh, really uh, give you great numbers on, you know, how much COVID we see but, uh, in peds, but it's really a much lighter burden. You know, we had the worst burden in the state for six weeks right after that October time when I came to speak to you. We had, uh, for six weeks running, we had the most COVID patients in the entire state in the building. And, at Covenant. 
And uh, there were many times, many days, that we had zero uh, patients in the pediatric unit with coronavirus. It really, the vast majority of days were zero inpatients. So the, the burden is not nearly as close. We haven't had a single patient die, um, a pediatric patient die from coronavirus, even though we've had the heaviest burden in the whole state. So we need to keep that in, in our calculations, and it, really it's not a calculation, in our humanity, and taking care of kids and keeping them uh, a sound in mind and body, keep them in school, uh, keep them safe there as you guys have been doing. You give them uh, the teachers and the schools the resources to keep them safe. And I'd say we continue with the same plan and we're going um, to get through this. Um, so a, a few specific asks, I mean, other than getting kids back into school immediately, I'd say we're ready to go back right now. I would say um, that we need to account for vaccinated students as well. We had a vaccine clinic that was promoted by uh, the school today. I appreciate that. I, I talked to the director of the vaccine uh, clinic at, that was at Horizon Center. We had 500 walk-ins today for vaccines. So please get kids out. We said, you know, there's not a lot of uh, kids that we can vaccinate. Well, actually, Mr. Janowski said it was 15 to uh, 30 nine that's the big peak we're seeing right now well, we can do 16 17 and 18 year olds both my kids are fully vaccinated so uh, we, we have big opportunities to be able to open that up for kids and not make it a forced thing make it you know like the blood drive kids will step forward and do this make them part of the effort too so that's the big ask i have is uh, that we uh, get right back to school it's the safest place for kids to be and um, uh, appreciate your time thank you thank you Okay, everybody, that is all the names that I had on my list. Um, the floor is still open for anybody else who wishes to come up and address the board. Is there anybody else in the room that would? Yes, sir. Can I come up? You certainly can. Um, my name is John Kowicki, and I'm a grandfather of a high school student. And I came here just to find out what was going on. I went to the, the rally on Saturday and then I was here the other day. And uh, if you want to run for Congress or the young man, I'm in. I, I saw him the other day. Here's what I want to say is set him up for the win. I grew up in Midland. I went to school in Midland. Other than my military service, I lived in Midland. I had a chance to go other places, but I came back to Midland because it's a great community. And I didn't know it when I was young, but my dad set me up for a lot of wins. As I got older, he got smarter. And he set me up for a lot of wins. As the adults, we have to set him up for the win. And the data doesn't support what we hit 14 months ago. I had that gentleman that said 14 months ago, the data does not support keeping them out of school. If you make the choice to be out of school, you have the option. You guys have done a great job. I came here, my daughter was one of the speakers. I got kind of pumped up here tonight. Um, we've got a great community here. Do you agree with that? Yeah. I, I love Midland. It's a great, I wouldn't have come back here if it wouldn't have. There, we have a lot of opportunities for a small community and this community prospers. We've got great people here. I'm gonna close with this. Set them up for the win. Thank you, Mr. Quickie. Anybody else? Okay. The point I'd like to make, are there any parents opposed to putting our kids back in school here at Rutherford Thank you. Okay. Okay, we will then close the floor. Uh, unless there's anybody else, last chance. Make a motion. Going, going, make gone. A motion okay. To okay. Uh, so I want to make a motion to extend. Okay, we have Mr. Hatfield with the motion to extend our meeting time. What are you, what are you extending it to? 10? 10 o'clock, we should do. Till 10 o'clock, okay. There's a motion on the floor to extend to 10 o'clock. Support. Support by Phil. Motion by John. Any discussion? Timing's good? No. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. 
So our motion to extend has been approved. We, uh, I think at this point we're going to take a. We're going to take a quick five minute break. Anybody? All right. Are, is everybody good? I'm good. Okay, you had talked about it you before. Got to go. Just go yeah, and go through. Got it. We're going to keep moving on. So that takes us to 5.1. We have Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Study Committee minutes from March 22nd, 2021. Lynn Baker is going to read those, but hold on, Lynn. Let's let the room clear out before you do. Hey, Megan. Can I get a water? Could I get a water? Lynn, I think whenever you're ready. Alrighty, the Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Study Committee met on March 22nd, and we started with the cur curriculum and staff development proposals. The curriculum team presented the proposals submitted for consideration. The 11 proposals represent the key areas of need for curriculum and professional development for the 2021-22 school year and are aligned to the district's vision and continuous improvement goals. The proposals will be presented for information to the Board of Education at the April meeting, followed by action at the May meeting. Implement implementation will be based on available funding and begin after July 1st, 2021. Next, we had a diversity, equity, and inclusion update. MPS staff is currently engaged in a 10-week racial equity challenge each week there is an opportunity to watch listen or read stories consisting of different perspectives on select topics participants are encouraged to then reflect engage in discussion either online or with colleagues and apply their learning the district is pleased to have received multiple proposals for the equity audit a team will review and assess the proposals against the criteria and make a final recommendation we adjourned at 2.45, and we actually met today, and those minutes will be forthcoming. Okay, thanks, Lynn. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Next up, item 5.2. This is for information only, textbook adoption. Good evening. Ready. We do have a book being presented for the 28-day period of examination. It is uh, available here in the curriculum office if anyone wishes to review that. The book will be used for math. Eight. The title is Big Ideas Math, Modeling Real Life, Grade 8. Authors are Larson and Boswell, and uh, this is from Big Ideas Learning. It follows the progression that we've had of adopting new math texts for our middle school. I can move right into 5.3 if that's all right for you. Yes, please. Thank you. We also have for information tonight a uh, host of staff development proposals. There are 11, uh, as Lynn indicated in the meeting minutes. We have been working really hard to align our curriculum and staff development proposals to our new continuous improvement model, aligned to our vision and our two goal areas. So the 11 proposals that you have in your agenda reflect the most important work that we have to do right now. Using general fund dollars, I'll remind you that there are still opportunities for curriculum and staff development through some of our supplemental funding. Uh, these are for your information. Happy to talk with anyone who needs more details, and we'll bring these back to you in May uh, for your approval. I'll just note, too, that uh, the Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Committee uh, reviewed these quite thoroughly. Uh, a point of consideration was minimizing the number of release days or guest teacher days, and that was one of our intents. So each year we've been decreasing the number of release days, and we continued to do that this year. Uh, so as you can read in your agenda, we have a variety of those. The first one is MyKIP, which is our new continuous improvement model, um, along with diversity, equity, and inclusion, and multi-tiered systems of support. We have four that are at the secondary level for core areas to continue curriculum revision there. We have a kindergarten KRA, which is a required assessment. Supporting our uh, elementary literacy curriculum adoption we have a PYP collaborative time proposal. Uh, one more look at our elementary report cards and handbooks uh, just to improve communication with parents. And then uh, similar to what you heard tonight from Melissa Toner and the team, we are supporting the next layer of blended and online learning uh, 
professional learning for teachers and uh, some work with our swivel and Android tablets. So that's what I have for you tonight. Okay, thank you, Penny, we appreciate it. Absolutely. Next up, we have an action item, item 5.4. This is the extended COVID-19 learning plan, our monthly reconfirmation. I move that we accept uh, the extended COVID-19 learning plan monthly reconfirmation. Item 5.4. I'll support them and listen to it. Yeah. Broken side. No, that's all right. To be honest, I don't. It, 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 is it in the package, Penny? It is. Yeah. yeah we and I think John, the back. John oh, was very okay. efficient yeah. tonight yep. in what we did. All right. I support. Oh, okay. We have a motion by John, support by Pam. Any further discussion regarding item 5.4? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Next up, we have item 6.1. This is on FFO study committee minutes. These are gonna be read by Mr. Lauterbach. Yes. Uh, the FFO committee actually met twice this past month. The first time was on April 7th uh, uh, by WebEx to listen to a uh, presentation from the district's financial advisors from PFM regarding potential refinancing options for the 2015 bonds. At current rates, the taxpayer savings, should we refinance, would be estimated at approximately $2 million. The committee then met on April 12th for its regularly scheduled meeting. We reviewed the February financials. Uh, February 2021 revenues were down in comparison to February 2020. This is a result of the timing of receipt of tax revenues in February 2020. We reviewed bid package 21-205. Bids were reviewed for the relocation of the main distribution framework and generator for the administration center. A recommendation will be brought to the April uh, board meeting. Food service renewal. The administration will present the second renewal of a five-year service agreement at the April board meeting. The service agreement has been reviewed and approved by the Michigan Department of Education. EnviroClean contract extension. The administration will recommend extending the current service contract with EnviroClean for two years. Asbestos abatement. Bids were solicited for asbestos abatement related to bid package 21-204. The administration will recommend award to Quality Environmental Services uh, Incorporated of Lansing. Series 2 bond funds will be utilized for the service if approved. Non-affiliated employee wage scales, uh, potential 21-22 wage adjustments were presented for feedback. And as we discussed earlier, the committee was provided a preview of budget workshop content uh, scheduled to be presented in which we heard uh, earlier at, at, uh, at the budget workshop meeting before this meeting. Our next uh, FFO committee meeting will be on May 3rd at 5 p.m. All right, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Hey, Scott, is there is there, was that well received for the savings? Is, is that something that we should encourage FFO to go forward with? Or is there a lot of groundwork that has to be put forth to do the refinance to save the $2 million? They are, I, I believe, correct if I'm wrong, that they're gonna start exploring we, that. We ask PFM to move the ball downfield on okay. and come back to us. Yep, thanks. Yep. And that'll come to you, Brad, as soon as they get <coughs> ready. Um, we had a little discussion with our financial advisor today. It's similar to the performance bond. There's a lot of lag work in there. Okay. So it'll, it'll come and then you'll have your chance to agree or not. Okay. Okay, next up we have an action item 6.2. This is asbestos abatement. Mr. Bruton. Yep, thank you, Mr. Prado. Um, we accepted bids and a tabulation was provided within your board packet for asbestos abatement related to our bid package 21204. There were actually two projects, a bundle with the high schools, which was bid, the low bid at 86,000, and a package at both of the middle schools, which was bid at 96,000. The low bidder on both projects was Quality Environmental Services of Lansing, Michigan, for a grand total award of 182,000. And if approved by you this evening, Series 2 bond funds will be utilized for those services. And we are recommending awarding the contract to Quality Environmental Services tonight. Make a motion to approve item 6.2 to award to low bidder Quality Environmental Services. Support. Okay, motion by Phil, support by F Pam. Any further discussion regarding item 6.2? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, motion carries, thank you very much. 
Next up, item 6.3, we have another action item. This is the bond construction bid, administration, MDF generator recommendations award. Yep, thank you. Um, this is referred to as bid package 21205, which included the relocation of the main distribution framework room and also the installation of a generator at the administration center. And we are recommending to you this evening for bid package 21205, uh, three separate categorical awards. First for electrical to Ted's Electric Service of Roads, Michigan for $47,965. Next, fiber to Master Electric of Gladwin for $38,321. And also to Master Electric, the category of network cabling of $29,186. The total award for bid pack 21205 is $115,472. Series two bond funds will be utilized for these if approved this evening. All right, thank you, Brian. I will accept the motion. I'll make a motion to approve item 6.3 for 21205 as denoted in the board pack. Second. Motion by Phil, support by Mr. Hatfield. Any further discussion regarding item 6.3? I just had one thing, Scott. Sure. Um, since we did such a phenomenal job of being under budget on that, um, I would encourage you to at least discuss a little bit further with Barton Mallow and, and your electrical contractor to see if maybe a small increment that we could even get a larger generator. So maybe we have some more flexibility at, at the administration center if we went to a, a larger size. Generator's been quite the hot topic, um, probably predominantly by me. And Dave, Dave uh, on different sides of it. I don't know. I, sometimes I wonder how often the generator actually gets used. I've been in through a bond, but I don't disagree totally, Brad. I just sometimes you look at it, the dollars you put into a generator, how often does it run? And so I've questioned it just throughout. It's, it's kind of funny that you're asking that because these two guys are probably chuckling at me because I've questioned how, how big of a need is it. So, okay. But I, you know me, I'm pretty frugal, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, thank you, Brad. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries, thank you. Next up, we have item 6.4, another action item. This is the EnviroClean Custodial Services Contract Renewal. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bruton. Thank you, sir. Um, we are recommending to you to um, allow us to enter an additional two years agreement with EnviroClean. We've been with EnviroClean since 2014-15. Um, the additional two years, the first year would be priced at $1,783,057.80. And the second year would be priced at $1,792,807.92. The first year is an increase of around $77,481. Um, that increase is largely due to um, using an additional EnviroClean employee as a building manager. And the second year, uh, the increase in contract, the 9,750 is largely due to raises. Um, we are asking for your permission to enter into this additional two year agreement with EnviroClean this evening. And these are based off of general fund dollars. Okay, thank you. I'll accept the motion. I'll move to approve item 6.4, EnviroClean custodial services contract renewal. Support. Motion by Pam, support by Phil. Any further discussion regarding item 6.4? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries, thank you. Okay, another action item, 6.5. This is for gifts totaling $6,000. Thank you. Yes, we do need your action to accept one gift this evening. As Ms. McFarland just um, mentioned, it is for $6,000 due to the generosity of the Dorothy O. Minical Business Education Endowment Fund, which benefits and supports expenses for the BPA and DECA events. We would appreciate you allowing us to accept this gift this evening. I move to accept uh, the gift totaling $6,000. Supports. I'm sorry. I John. Oh, John, okay. Motion by Pam, support by Mr. Lauterbach. Any discussion regarding 6.5? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, absolutely. Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you. All right, next up, we have information only. 
Mr. Bruton. Thank you. Item 6.6 .6 is gifts, but these are informational only and not requiring your approval. 10 gifts to inform you of this evening, totaling $8,640.26. These gifts range from donations to the HH Dow Turf Project to sports equipment and also landscaping materials. As is typical, these individuals will be honored through board correspondence and also in the credits, so we appreciate their generosity this evening. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, that brings us to item 7.1, Human Resources Study Committee Minutes from April 8th, 2021. I Pam. Those. Uh, the HR Study Committee members present were Pam Singer, Phil Roush, John Hatfield, Mr. Sherrill, Mr. Bruton, and Mr. Kowalski. Uh, Mr. Sherrill discussed the ret uh, retirement notification received from Central Park Elementary Assistant Principal Kelly McArdle. Uh, the administrator retirement stipend was reviewed. Mr. Kowalski provided details of a recent resignation agreement reached with Ms. Espa. Mr. Kowalski provided an update on the teacher staffing timeline, including current job postings. Mr. Kowalski gave an overview of the DEI recruitment strategy and results from a recent virtual career fairs. And the group discussed the recent surge in local COVID-19 cases. It was noted that some staff members have been close contacts but received full vaccination, resulting in fewer staff quarantine orders. That was the end of the meeting. Okay, thank you, Pam. Uh, next up, item 7.2, Mr. Jester. Thanks, Mr. McFarland. Um, the Board of Education and Midland Public School staff extend their deepest sympathy to the family of J. Michael Riley passed away March 13th, 2021. J. Michael was a speech and drama teacher at multiple buildings, received a Gerstacker Award in 1989. He retired in 1997 with 24 years of service. Also uh, to the family of Roy Lynn McNeil, who passed away on March 11th, 2021. Roy worked as a teacher for MPS, retired in 1991 with 34 years of service. And then lastly, the family of Richard Henry Northard, passed away on March 9th, 2021. Richard was a teacher at Midland High School, retired in 1992 with 32 years of service. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have our correspondence to and from the Board of Education that is listed in the agenda. Uh, we also have a FOIA request under 8.2 from Clary Business Machines. Uh, under item 9.1, we have our remaining regular scheduled business meetings. Uh, you can see them all itemized there. And that brings us to uh, number 10, our study discussion. And at this point, I will uh, ask the board if there are any points of clarification to discuss uh, regarding anything that's going on tonight that um, we need to hash out any further. I guess I'd like to say something. Um, I hear the group tonight and I appreciate the, the everyone who had the courage to come out and talk to us and share their point of view. And that's an important part of our process. Um, I also support Mr. Sherrill and this administrative staff and our board in the decisions we made. And those decisions were very thoughtful. And using data, using, using the um, processes that we've had in place. And that's important to remember. This week, I read um, in the Grand Rapids Press, I read in the Detroit Free Press about the numbers of patients in hospitals. I read about triage tents being put up outside of hospitals. When I listened to the governor, she didn't even uh, finish her last sentence. And I was already texting Mike saying, all right, what is our next step? What do we do? And he's already making plans, already. We're gonna talk to the superintendents. We're gonna pull these people together, the health department, and the other districts and 
we're making this plan knowing that we have a responsibility to our students, to our staff, to our families, to our communities, to our community, to our athletes. And we have to take off our individual family hat, our individual, I'm a mom of an athlete and I would love to watch my son play baseball, and make that decision to what we believe is the best decision for our students and all students in the district. Are we going to make a decision that is 100% right and that is going to make everyone happy? Absolutely not. But what we will do and, and what I commit to do is take those decisions seriously, do the reading, listen to the experts, use the people around me, not assume that I know all of the answers, and try to make the best decision going forward. But this is unprecedented times, right? We've never gone through this before. So being together as a board and making these decisions is so important. And supporting our administration in, in the hard work that you're doing to set us up for success. And tonight, if you look at our board pack at 160 pages, you see all the things that we are focused on. And we need to be proud of and support each other through. We aren't going to agree on everything, but I tell you, if we're working together and supporting each other, we're going to have a stronger district and we're gonna keep our kids safe. I, I, I really appreciate all the work you have done. I appreciate this board for making the hard decisions and sticking behind them and answering the phone. And you know, when, when Mike reaches out to be able to, to talk, talk these things through and engage. And you know, that's, that's why we're in, in this position. So I just want to thank you guys, the administrative staff, the educators in the classroom, in the buildings, and my fellow board members for what you've done and, and supporting each other and making the best decisions we can make for our whole student body. So thank you. Thank you, Pam. That was well said. Um, I, I really appreciated everybody coming out tonight. We kind of knew what to expect. We knew what everybody's feelings were. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to say something that's been bothering me for about a week, and that is a statement that Mr. Blasey put out there in space uh, by way of an email. I sent all of you a copy of it, um, and, and it says, I quote, I was not in favor of our district following the governor's recommendation on Friday. And this was a, an email that was sent to a number of people and put out in Ask Midland 2.0 and other social media sites says, in paren, no board meeting occurred, no board vote occurred, but board consensus was legally reached overruling my opinion, period, end paren. At no point, Brad, that I'm aware of, did you have any contact with any board member expressing your opinion? It's my understanding that Mike contacted you on Friday, left a detailed message, and didn't hear back from you in any way, shape, or form. In fact, I was the first person to contact you about this Sunday night, at which point you said, I didn't agree with it and I'm not going to support the solution. So I think it's bad form for you to throw us all under the bus like you're the lone martyr here and say, hey, I told everybody what I think because that's what they all believe. That was, her, that was Car I believe, Carrie's comment. She said, thank you for standing up for us and against the other board members. It, it was just really bad form. And so that's bothered me for a week and I just wanted to call you on that, that next time do us a favor and let us know you're going to put something out like that. That's all I've got to say. As a board, we need to be able to engage with each other and have yeah. these discussions because throwing that out there puts us against you, and that's not right. That's, no. not, a way, that's not the way a board should work. We need to operate better than that. But also, I have the right to express my opinion. Abs you, absolutely. you absolutely do, Brad. Absolutely. You, you yeah. absolutely do. But you, what you don't get to do is sit on the sidelines, refuse to return Mike's call, and then claim that you were the lone voice of reason. You weren't. You chose to sit out, and that's fine. You had your opinion. 
you're entitled to it. The rest of us took the time to take Mike's call, talk through the pros and cons of this decision, that he really, he had a tough time with this. This was a very difficult decision. The reason we're here is to give him our counsel and give him advice when he has these difficult decisions to make. And if you don't want to take the call, that's fine. But you don't get to put out a, a, a statement on social media saying they didn't listen to me. If you want to be listened to, talk to them. Communicate. If you don't, that's, that's fine. But you don't get to have it both ways. I, I, th I think we're all, I think the rest of the board really felt like you threw us under the bus. Yeah. And now you've got somebody coming to, to public comment thanking you because you're the voice of reason. We're here doing the work. I tried and to give flash, them a the voice work, because they wanted to address you. You and call, I time did out. not sit on the sideline. Time out. This is my I'm, chance to talk. You'll get your chance in just a minute. You waited four days to call an emergency meeting. If you wanted to have the conversation, take the phone call. It's not an emergency when you wait four days. And you get everybody whipped up into a frenzy because they think we're not listening to them. That's not fair. I'm done and I'm willing to listen. Okay. So if your focus is on the Friday, then you missed the point of it. The po point of the letter was that they wanted an emergency meeting. I asked you guys to not sit on the sideline. I went to the 50 yard line and asked you to come join me, except I couldn't get you out of the locker room. So on saying that I'm sitting on the sideline, absolutely not. How long did it take you to return Mike's call on Friday? I wasn't even in the state of Michigan. He knows where I was. Does the phone work outside the state of Michigan, Brad? The ink Could was you dry, call John. Him back? John, the ink was he dry. He told you he was going to wait six I had a, hours. I had a voicemail at 12:13, and I got a copy of the communique at 4:20. Four hours. What'd you do in the meantime? Did I was call Mike back. I was not even on my phone at that point in time. I was out of the state, John. Okay. Lots okay. of people go out of state. So and they on Sunday, their phone when Scott them. calls me, I said that I don't agree with the compromise, and I didn't agree with Friday. I have my opinion. Okay. I shared my opinion. And then two more days, you called an emergency meeting to do what? You didn't take the call on on Friday. Sunday, you have the conversation with Brad. Tuesday, all of a sudden, we have to jump and have an emergency board meeting when the rest of us have been dealing with the fallout on Friday and Saturday and Sunday and talking to and responding to text messages and emails from parents who are upset with the decision that was made. Now on Tuesday, it's an emergency. It's not an emergency when you sit there for four days and do nothing. I wasn't sitting there doing nothing. I handled just as many phone calls as you did. So okay. after listening to those phone calls, I asked you to have an emergency meeting to listen to these people, these people and more people. Okay? I wanted them to have a voice. I wanted them to be heard. I wanted them to be heard in a timely manner. I have my opinion. I'm sorry you don't agree with it. it I was not, not my intention to throw this board under the bus. It, it, in it, my letter that I wrote, I made sure that I was very, very calculated in every word that I said. Scott processed my request perfectly. He put it out to you guys, followed the bylaws. You followed the bylaws, you had an opportunity, you didn't think that it was imminent or the wording of the emergency board meeting. You, you made that. a decision and you chose to say that it wasn't right. imminent to be heard at that point in time. No, no, no. no nobody followed... expressed a reason why it was a yes or no vote. That okay. was it. There was no discussion beyond yes or no. I understand that. It's not, Brad, it's not the, it's not the opinion. I, look, I personally, I'm not all that far from, from where you are on this. I don't agree with everything Mike does. I'll at least take his phone call and tell him that. And, and I think the rest of us do too. But we, we, can't, we, we have to work together even if we disagree with each other. And we have to talk about this stuff and we have to be willing to communicate with each other. And, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a symptom of a bigger problem that we've, that we've had as a board for, 
for quite a while. And I guess the you know the rest of us have just kind of can I redirect kind of come a to a head without so. getting in, in your business. Um, so hey, I've been doing this for a long time, and I know I say that, but I've been a superintendent a damn long time. And the hardest part for any superintendent anywhere, and I hope to do a few more years, and you're going to have a new one. And there's a few things that's going to make it difficult for the one that follows me. Um, civility. We had a fairly civil meeting, but a lot of the emails I received were not civil in any capacity anyway. And, and lucky I'm a tough old guy because a lot of people would not have taken what they had. Brad, the hardest part working for a board is not having direction at all, even if it's negative. John does disagree with me, and he do tells me that. That helps me form my opinion. Friday, the governor and my, and I, John, I think a comment you made is absolutely true. Would I write my communique differently? I was upset. I thought the governor threw the school districts under the bus and making a recommendation without any notice again to any superintendent in the state. And when I asked for advice, the, the advice I received was, you could lose your immunity. We don't know what she just did. She granted it earlier, but now she's telling you a recommendation. And if you don't follow it and you did have a kid get sick, do you have that? Would I write it differently and emphasize the health of the community more than that potential litigation I would? But that's the thinking you guys provide for me. And so an impression out there is I acted on my own. I did not act on my own. You often do give me a lot of leeway as a board because I maybe earned trust and move forward. But that one, I called all of you because that is not a decision I make on my own. And, 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 and I am allowed to call each of you and see where you're at. You're at. That, that's, like you said, that's legal. I can't go beyond that. But I need the direction. Brad, you, you sometimes are a different voice. That's okay. I need to know that in order to operate and go forward. And that makes us better. We heard a lot of voices tonight. I'm with John. I, I could go either way right now on this. What we did was we paused because we heard our health experts, including Fred, say, for the health of the community. So tonight it was about kids, and are they the safer in school? They are, and I'll stand by that. And I hate to say this, and I'll say it a little bit, because we enforce rules in schools. And there needs to be more rules in our community until we get out of this darn thing. And I'm not a, hey, if you know my personality, I'm not a COVID fearer at all. I don't fear a whole lot of anything in life, to be honest. But this is a reality. Our numbers were huge. Our school numbers were going high suddenly. We had more positive cases at that point in time than any time we had in the entire school. We've never been above single digits until the last three weeks. Fred says, for the health of the community, maybe we should take a pause. So I immediately met with the four superintendents and Fred afterwards. I call all of you. We need those mindsets together to look at it. So there was never the intent and anybody who's worked with me, and Brian's worked with me the longest anyone here, but anyone who's worked with me in my entire career, I'm the biggest protector of instructional time for students. I demand that we don't waste minutes. Why do you think I don't like to call snow days? So for me to call a two week pause is like almost against my personality trait. But I felt with the governor's recommendation, the Michigan Department of Health and Services, our local health director, that we ought to take the pause, that nine days might be worth it. We might actually be able to complete a school year without major quarantines, major quarantines, and we might actually be able to finish an athletic year because I, as I explained to Pam, one quarantine could take out several of players on a team. I do need a couple quick ones, and Scott's telling me we only went to 10. I want to correct a couple of things. Staff fully, fully vaccinated 14 days after is not quarantine. You no longer quarantine. Students will not have to be quarantined 14 days after they're vaccinated. We won't make it probably at the end of the year because we have two vaccine clinics. I think there's, someone mentioned the one their child what, fully. If they were a close contact, they will not have to be quarantined. We do not quarantine. The school district does not. We do not have the authority. The health department does. Someone thinks I must quarantine everyone. I do not. I've warned every minister in the district we don't play health professional. We contact Trace for them. Pam comes with a positive. Pam was in six classes who was within six feet, 15 minutes. We don't overdo it. We only do what we know, and we provide those names and contacts to the health department. As Fred said, they give a case investigator. The case investor checks it out. There's been times they put kids back in schools. Not a lot, but there's been times we do not quarantine. That, that needs to be uh, in the vaccination of staff. We don't quarantine staff. Hardly any staff's been quarantined. 
Not all staff, though, vaccinated. They have that right. Do we know, someone mentioned today, do we know all the staff? We don't have a right to know. They often tell us when, they, hey, you've been a close contact. I've been fully vaccinated at 14 days. Then, then they're not. They have that discussion with, the, with them. So antigen testing. Fred says it's 90, over 90% accurate. We have not had an antigen test overturned at this point in time. But the Michigan High School, Michigan Department of Health, requires the antigen test. Midland Public Schools does not. We must follow the rules that have set. That antigen testing um, result forces to get out, but then there's a requirement to go get a deeper testing if the parent would like, and if it overturns it, then they would be back. So there's a couple points of clarification that needs to be made in there. Can I just quick move, give them five more minutes? Can we move to make the meet, meeting end at 10.05? I'll support that. Yeah, the other one is SAT. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. The other one was SAT that was mentioned tonight, and Penny can help me on this, but we have made multiple calls to SAT, and it appears we cannot move the date. Correct, Penny? Yeah, it's correct. The May date is a contingency date and we are required to test on the 27th. So, I, you know, I, I, I... Can kids retake? On their own. On their own. On their own. Okay. And we yeah. can provide that information if that's helpful to families. Um, honestly, guys, you know, I, I don't stress a whole lot anymore in my career, but anyone thinks this decision was an easy one, and, and we knew going in, we are damned if we do and damned if we were don't on this decision going forward. I think if there is any positive, and believe me, I don't pretend to think that we're perfect on any of this. I don't think Fred really knows, but our, our, our positive numbers today decreased about in half. Our quarantine list is quite large, particularly for, for a district who has not had secondary kids in school, but four days because of spring break and almost a month and we have 350 kids quarantined. By the way, Dow High's almost 10% of their students are quarantined right now. That's difficult. Mark was sitting out here right now and knows many times teachers have 12 kids out, eight in front of them. That, that is a not an ideal teaching situation in the school either. I get what parents are saying. Why did we not do the whole district? We don't wanna leave young children sitting at home um, unsupervised. Why do I not wanna call snow days? I know parents need me to have them open also for secure care of their children so it's a difficult one i don't you know i don't know where we go at this point I, you know we go we stick it out and go forward i don't know that it was a perfect decision but we thought the two-week pause would get us through to the end of the school year that was our thoughts well i think you know from the board perspective i i think you know that we want kids in school if it is at all possible mm -hmm. and we absolutely we hope that you and your leadership team will do whatever you can to get kids back in the classroom as soon as possible safely face-to-face -face instruction I'm the biggest fan of it I've been saying it all year I, I the day last spring <clears throat> Brian I came in one day and said Brian I want you to buy 10,000 masks and I want you to start buying this and buying this before it's all gone because I was adamant we need to have face-to-face -face instruction we do need to have it during the summer I sat down and told Penny hey you're gonna have to develop three different plans I think we worked 70 80 hours a week during the summer and really regretted at times doing it but we want to give parents choice but if, if it was up to me I would force every parent back into school because it is the rest thing for kids but let's go back. We took a two week, and I know you can't just say two weeks, but we took a two week. It also worked in the fall when we took the pause. I don't, I'm not saying it's perfect. Our thoughts were in the right place. We were doing the right thing. we moving forward. Who's, who's to know which way this is right? So, do I, so was there a concern tonight about Monday? There's no intent for any of us, I don't believe, not to be going to school on Monday. Right. And I, don't, I almost don't think it no matters what the numbers are because we've d decided that two weeks doesn't help us with numbers, so be it, we're gonna have to go back to school. Mm -hmm. And our hope is to finish the school year and finish all athletic seasons. And this may give us a little opportunity. The antigen testing, the reason Michigan High School and MDH agree to it, is it may actually prevent the positive test from mass quarantine and them losing season. But I think we've beaten that point, and we're about, uh, about our five minutes. I was, God, you, got, you got two left if you want to. <laughs> I don't. I really don't. Okay. I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Support. Okay. Motion by John. Support by Phil. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We are adjourned.
Thank you, everybody.